So welcome everybody to our November Ordinary Council meeting for the town of Bassendine. Um, um, so in the language of the First People, um, I wish to say that we know that we're gathered here today on Wajak Munga land um, and always was, always will be. And it's really important for us here in the town of Bassendine to always acknowledge the traditional owners of the land who continue to play an important part not, in, not only in our history but in our present and our future. Um, tonight is the first meeting of our new council, so welcome to Councillor Hilary McWilliams and Councillor Chris Barty, and also to our new executive team member Luke Gibson, who's also his first ordinary council meeting. Um, we have a great opportunity ahead of us as a new council, a new um, administration to see some great things happening in our town if we um, all work together with the community over the coming two years. So I look forward to seeing what this group of people um, together with the community can um, do in our town. Um, first thing on the agenda is our public question time and the opportunity for community members to make statements um, to council. So first of all, I'd just like to bring everyone's attention to the fact that we um, not only record but live stream our meetings in an effort to increase um, transparency and also provide better access to our community to uh, the decisions of council. Um, so I would first of all like to um, invite anybody who would like to ask a question um, that relates to the town of Bassendine to come forward and ask that question. And if that is you, if you can just raise your hand and I'll invite you to come up. So first of all, Ms Jacobson. I've got a question regarding the traffic counting on Hardy Road and why was that mission to go or by? What's the purpose of the traffic counting? Um, Thank you. To the Chair, thanks for the question, Noni. Um, the we're doing traffic counts all over the town um, just to assess volumes, speeds, um, etc. So uh, we are undertaking a entire town um, traffic assessment and Hardy Road. There's been reports from some locals um, in regards to and some concerns raised in regards to speeding. So we're we're assessing Hardy Road in that respect. Okay, thanks. We'll note that. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know your name. Richard Salado, resident of Guildford for 50 years, was owner of 62 Railway Parade Bassendine, which is zoned R20-40 uh, into three 240 square metre blocks. I did send a, uh, a question in on notice uh, uh, why are some of your staff hell bent on delaying approvals uh, um, in regard to the removal of a tree which was on the boundary and uh, the environmental condition which your staff refused to sign off says measures be taken to ensure and identify and protect of any vegetation on the site worthy of retention that is not impacted on subdivisional works. We presented your staff with a letter from the electrician saying he could not install underground power because of the tree. Also, a letter from a 30 year experienced tree lopper saying the tree was leaning, was white handed had been heavily pollarded and was dangerous, the response from your staff was, give us $6,700 and we'll sign off on the environmental clause. There isn't that much funds 
in a, 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 the environment of hard sale, selling land at the moment to f facilitate $6,700. We went to STAT, STAT signed off no conditions, no penalties. You think that would have been the end of it? No. After, after it was approved and uh, we sold two blocks off, the last block to be sold, a number of buyers fronted council or fronted your staff, planning department or someone via email, I don't know, I wasn't privy to it, to be told, yes, we would like a six metre setback. This is on a property with a 13 metre boundary on a corner, a house that was demolished that wasn't six metres setback. Half of the houses in Railway Parade don't have a six metre setback. And it was only through my agent and yourself, uh, Peter, that some common sense finally prevailed. And uh, at, at, um, suppose at that meeting, it wasn't an issue. While there's these constant delays, it doesn't look good for the council and when they continuously go to SAT, sooner or later SAT and the bureaucrats and the government of the day will say off with their heads, let's revisit the mega councils that were proposed by Barnett 10 years ago. Thank you. Doing, doing all you good folk who contribute to the community out of a job and the community out of uh, having a local representation. Thank you. I really appreciate you raising it with us. I'm not familiar with that application, but I think um, you've had contact with our CEO, so maybe you can address... Hi, Mr Salado. Thanks very much for coming along. My name's Peter, and I think Mr Harwood may have represented yes, your interests. Right. I have spoken to Mr Harwood about this matter. I'm not fully across all the detail that you've mentioned, but I'd be very happy to follow it up and give you a call tomorrow. Well, it was put in a letter to uh, um, uh, council and uh, I w was hoping to get a, a some response today because that was uh, sent and it said that it was going to uh, a Graham, uh, Graham, someone, uh, Graham, no, can't think of his name, uh, planning officer. Mm. Okay. I, I can give you a call tomorrow. Um, oh. I, if, if we've got your details or email, yes. I'd be happy to give you a call tomorrow no. and let you know. So Disappointed again to not have heard a response, especially having gone to the trouble of mm. making contact and being told that it was forwarded for a response. Mm. But if you haven't got it, well, yeah. we can't do much about that. I, I haven't cited anything at this stage. Um, Mr Harwood did give me, give me a call and uh, we talked through the issues, but I'm not fully across all the details that you've just mentioned, but I'd be happy to follow it up and I'll give you a call tomorrow. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> I did see another hand wanting to ask a question. Uh, Ms Bremer first. Jane Bremer, 477 Avenue. Um, yesterday, our community uh, suffered uh, a very nasty toxic uh, exposure as a result of the clean away uh, facility in South Guildford catching fire. Um, the smoke from that uh, facility blew all over Bassendine. Um, there was ash everywhere, there was debris in people's backyards, the smoke was thick and hazy, um, and it's still about in the air today. Um, there hasn't been any uh, explanation from, from uh, Clean Away or an apology or even a commitment to ensure that it doesn't happen again. So um, my uh, request, I guess, it request slash question uh, to the council is, will our council uh, step up and advocate for our community? My son's come home from si uh, school quite sick today as a result of having to play outside. I was in Midland at uh, 11 o'clock and there was smoke flowing around the whole area, visibly, almost at ground level. Um, so uh, my question to the council is, um, this uh, company is not showing itself to be a good corporate neighbour at the moment. Um, we don't have access to information, critical public health information. So I have two questions. Will the council write to the state agencies and ask for information um, for our community about 
the air quality monitoring data and the dust deposition uh, um, monitoring that they've undertaken. And secondly, will our council write to the state government in the strongest possible terms and request an inquiry into this facility, into the fire and into the impact on the surrounding community, specifically to consider whether there's an adequate buffer zone around this plant and what measures will be in place to make sure it doesn't happen again because it's not acceptable for our community as the host community to carry the burden of environmental health impacts from a facility that's storing up to a million tonnes of compressed, bailed, highly flammable plastic. Thank you. I'm just wondering, whether, have we received any information? We haven't, apart from the public alerts that were provided and obviously the news updates and so on, but I'd be happy to follow that up with state government and that would be great because I don't know if you noticed but Bassendean wasn't listed in the uh, Department of Fire and Emergency Services alert. Virtually every suburb around us was but not Bassendean. Yeah. Um, and it took some effort on my part to get the Fire and Emergency, uh, State Government Agencies to upgrade those alerts to actually include health information to contact schools and all those kinds of things. That didn't happen for a really long time. So there needs to be a better emergency response, particularly for the host communities around this plant. It's a very large facility. It's clearly a, a hazard. This is also a company that has taken over um, our uh, hazardous waste uh, business. So I'm, I'm we've wondering, got a lot to be concerned about. I'm wondering whether um, we can also raise it through our local, local emergency management Sorry. committee. That might be an appropriate place to address it. Thank you. I really appreciate you raising it, and particularly that point where we were missed out in the alert for Town of Bassendean. Mm -hmm. That's really quite concerning. It is, because a lot of um, community members contacted me about that, and there's a lot of people went to hospital last night. So it's a significant concern for our community. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. Ron Snellgar, 16 Ancy Road, Bassendean. Madam Mayor, can you tell me when the town plan planning scheme 4A is going to be finalised? Because the Government Gazette is now hopeless. Because you stated previously that it would be finalised by the 23rd of February 2021. And obviously, uh, that's gone beyond that now. Yes, and you're right, there has been some recent conversation about that and there, there is a previous council decision that um, does set a date for finalisation of the, of the planning scheme. That item was to be on tonight's agenda but we've deferred it to December I think um, because we have two new councillors who have not had the benefit of being across all the complexity of that town planning scheme. Um, but the intention is to bring a report to council next month with a plan um, forward for the finalisation of that scheme. Is that correct, Mr Gibson? Yeah. Anything that you would yeah. like to add? No? Um, a second question, uh, following on from that, those comments uh, about the workshop. Um, how many workshops have you had uh, in the last 12 months and what is the cost of the workshop to the ratepayers in dollar terms? Mm -hmm. Usually the workshops are just held with the councillors and the executive staff so there's no additional costs for those workshops to be held. Um, you don't have anything to eat or drink? We have workshops every single week that we're, where we discuss a number of topics and usually the councillors will get a simple meal but I don't think the addition of the Town Planning Scheme 4A workshops into that schedule has had a significant impact on that. Yeah. See, one, one of my problems is after 35 years of this town planning scheme 4A uh, and uh, many, many workshops, some of them uh, by uh, uh, you know, learned experts, um, what's going to happen in two years' time when possibly three councillors may lose their seats and we've got three new councillors on board, but we're going to have a new workshop for them as well? Because the town planning scheme for rain will still be in existence. Possibly, but as I said, there will be a report in December which is intending to have a pathway forward to finalise the scheme. So it would just be uh, me making um, guesses at what would happen when the next election occurs. But at this point in time, the intention is for us to have a plan um, as of December. So I can't say anything more than that at this point. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Further questions? Yes, Mr Busby. 
Bill Busby, Hague Street, Ashfield. Uh, well done to the councillors and staff for the Ashfield Community Forum the other day. It was been brilliantly run and uh, well done to you all for that. Now, as you well know, I've been busy on social media with 6054, mainly in regards to what I consider, it's a personal opinion, the Weeds Forum, massive cost. I have written, took your advice, and I have written to Peter Mabs. I didn't get a, 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 an answer back with dollar values. So I'll go back and check the emails in case there's any come in late this afternoon. But I do write to Peter and the, the different people, follow the correct forum. When there's things happening on social media, some of it's very good, like the 6054, particularly in regards to crime and whatever. So that, and it's free for me to do so. And I get other people commenting. So there is a lot of people out there, when I was lucky enough to win door knock, a lot of people brought up the weed problem and situation is still continuing. I'm worried in the next five or 10 years, the amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars <coughs> that's going to be spent on weed control. Now I really play a great deal of faith in your green collar worker guys. They've got SDS sheets, they've got unions, and the unions that we're involved with, nobody will be allowed to do stuff with the sun safe. So they'll be given protection, they'll be trained, and that's what we all do. If they're around the house, we teach our children how to play safely, how to use stuff, and we store stuff safely. So I think we're spending a lot of money, a lot of effort for a few people, and it's fine. We can all be passionate about stuff, I've got plenty of stuff I'm passionate about. So I'm, I'm personally concerned about the cost. So that's that one. The can I, can I just up. address that? Sorry for a moment. Sorry. Um, so I hear what you're saying about the cost of the forum, but I think as I've communicated with you, um, the forum is the start of a process where we're looking at the weed strategy overall. And that comes from um, concerns not only from members of the community, but also members of council who want to make sure that the weed management is not only cost effective, but also um, deals with the weeds and is as environmentally and health conscious as possible. So the concerns that you raise are one of the reasons why we've gone down this path so that we can come up with a plan that does address the concerns and better meets the needs of our community. That's the end of question time. Do we have a move to extend question time? Move Councillor Wilson, seconded Councillor Gangel. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Um, so I think the process that we've set in motion is intended to address some of the concerns that you are raising and they're not concerns that are just um, yours, they're shared by other members of the community, but this has been a topic where there have been very wide ranging opinions. So this is an attempt for us to bring people together and have an evidence based plan that we can go and move ahead with, with confidence. Been working with your parks and gardens guys for 11 or 12 years now for weed control on the sports halls and we'll continue to do <coughs> that. Happy to help them, happy to do it. But I just see in two years' time, whatever it is, there's roughly two hundred thousand dollars being spent on the weed control, the forum, the time you take away the councillors and staff that turned up, be less than ten people turned up, and to me, that's probably not as well as it should be. I, I had trouble going onto the the, the Vaseline page to find exactly when it was on, knew it was on, anyway, got there, that's fine. And did you have another point, Mr. Yes, Coffey? another point was was with the cameras, and um, I was hoping to call into the Shire office this afternoon. I did dig this out as an article from 2010. I'll just pass that round if I may for you guys to have a look at. There's basically, thanks Chris. There's basically um, in 2010, so seven years ago, we had 17 attempts, a few of them successful for the sports club. Cost of fortune, insurance, and I don't know, the, the, being the, uh, the president of the club, at two or three o'clock in the morning, I'd be down there making the place safe and that wasn't very pleasant because you never knew if the guys were still inside or out. So we lost a lot of money, a lot of damage. We went and did repairs. They were all on us. Uh, Bass and Dean footy club, soccer club, had some break and entry. The council reimbursed them two or three thousand dollars or gave them five thousand dollars in the exact amount. Good luck to Back then we got nothing. <coughs> so you were referring to the cameras though? Well, I'd like to see the cameras which are parked in the office, in the, 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 the workshops. So instead of monitoring the car park there, which is apparently what it was doing for a little period, get it out on the street. There's still a lot of stuff happening out there. It's a visual thing. Cameras do help police. And it's just a suggestion yeah. for so the area. If we're not the police, we don't want to be the police. Yeah. But if we can help reduce crime in the area, Get the, get the 
uh, trailers with the cameras upgraded and on the street, in my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think you raised that last week at the briefing yes. session, and if I recall correctly, um, Mr Adams said that he would have a look at the, the trailer and how that could be best be used. So. Okay. So it's on the road. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, Mr Busby, could you just send me your email again? Because I can't find it. That would be great. Thank you. Um, just let's see if there's anybody else first. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? So I'll make this the final question and then we'll move on then. Thanks, Ms Bremer. Sorry about that. I'll just remind you of something while I was sitting here. Um, recently, just this year, um, one of the most senior traditional owners of uh, Successful Reserve, Dr. Karana, passed away. Um, I can't remember where this is up to, but I'd like to ask again. Um, there's been several trees that have died at the reserve and haven't been replaced. Um, I've been speaking to the family and to the other traditional owners. We'd really like to be able to have a tree or a plaque or, or something, some some recognition for Albert at Success Hill Reserve. So I'm wondering if that's possible. I think um, there is some work underway um, and we're actually consulting with the South West Aboriginal Land Council at the moment in regards to the <coughs> interpretive signage at Success Hill and also the spillway. So that's certainly something that we can consider as part of that project. Is it possible for Friends of Success Hill Reserve to have a briefing or an update or some sort of communication about Certainly it? Certainly, we can uh, incorporate that as part of the community engagement to do with that project. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so we'll move on to 2.3, which is statements by members of the public. Um, if there's anybody who'd like to make a statement on any item that's on tonight's agenda, now is your opportunity. So once again, if you just want to raise your hand and I'll invite you to come and um, address council. Ms Jacobson. I'm Jacobson, Spartan Parade, Bassendean. I'd just like to address item 11.1, which is regarding weaving the estate on of Wilton Road. And uh, you drive along with the road, it's also not just the road bus and but the road all the way to the and other parts of the Perth metropolitan area. The main roads generally have weed infestations of flea vein, uh, but it's not something that's unique to this town. Um, there has been a lot of discussion, argument about this particular weed infestation on the Gilford Road and how it's unsightly and bringing down the tone and that and all of those things. Um, and I see that it's an item on the agenda tonight and the recommendation to use STEAM I think is a really good one because um, for several years now it's been quite clear that that particular weed is resistant to the most commonly used herbicide which is glyphosate. Um, it's one of many weeds which have developed a resistance to this herbicide because it is used so much. Uh, weeds seed every year and sometimes those new plants that grow have developed a resistance and uh, continue to grow. And I've got the updated, well, it's 2018 glyphosate resistant weeds poster for you guys to have. And it's great, you can see all these, pretty much all of these weeds around Bassendean and other local areas. Um, and it really does show us, I think, why steam is possibly a better solution on those hard surfaces because the steam is actually going to knock off the seeds of these plants as well. Um, anyway, that's just for your information and hopefully you find that interesting. Um, it's a great idea chart too, even if, the, if you see a plant and you don't know what it is, it's probably on here. Thank you. I can't say I've ever been offered a glyphosate resistant weed chart before. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other statements? Okay, thank you everybody. Um, we'll move on to item three, which is attendance apologies and applications for leave. Everyone is here tonight. Are there any um, requests for leave? Yes, I will be uh, out of the country from the 23rd of December to the 6th of January. Any others? Okay, in that case, um, I will move to approve the leave. Is there a seconder? Councillor Wilson, always in favour. Carried unanimously. Um, so we're moving on to item four now, which is deputations. So we've got a number of people speaking tonight um, in relation to items 10.8 and 10.9, which are um, the community sponsorship and grant applications. So first of all, I might invite Jeremy Warnock, um, who is representing the Inhill Dads group. Uh,
um, who've made a request for up to two thousand dollars for the end of year picnic. Sorry to make you first, Jeremy. But if you'd like to come up and sit at the table with councillors, um, and if you wouldn't mind just giving us a uh, run down on what you're proposing, and then maybe the councillors um, may like to ask you some questions to clarify anything. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate your time. Okay. So for those of you who don't know. Eden Hill Dads is a subgroup of our Eden Hill PNC. The Dads group is affiliated with the Farthing Project, which run at the UWA. It's been headed up by Bruce, uh, Professor Bruce Robinson. The idea behind the Fathering groups are to encourage dads to be more involved with their families and the kids, and to be there for the children when they need them, which sometimes gets forgotten when work gets in the way. With flying and fly-out workers, these times can be stressful as well. So the idea really about the fathering group is to drum home just how important it is that these kids have a father figure in their lives. We do this a number of ways. Um, we support the school where we can. We provide, um, <coughs> we do activities and events for the school. And we also encourage the dads to go out there and have one-on-one -on -one time with their kids so that they get involved and have an interest and understand what the kids are going through, what the interests are, what their likes are. And so it builds that relationship and fosters that nurturing between both the father and the, and the kids right up to the point you know, well, forever. Um, yes, the last thing you want to be is to find out that your child has an issue with drugs or girls or anything like that and you'd be the last person to know about it. Now our events and that really are just sort of the fun things behind the fathering group. They're to get people and families involved. Most of our events are father and child only events but every so often we put on a whole family event give mums a break because the mums are gently you know, if anyone has been to a public school or any school really the schools are very matriarchal societies where mums doing the pickups mums doing the play dates mums in the canteen so with our fathering events we really try to make it something that the dads organize the dads maintain and the dads look after so mums can just go along and enjoy it as well so what we have wanted to do this year is we're putting on a end of year picnic for all the families to come along it's for our school community we're hoping to make it a free event where the families can just come along and for three, two to three hours they can come along and have some fun. Now the money that I've requested here is to pay for some amusements for the kids. We started um, looking at a couple of different ideas and what we would really like to do, we started off with this idea of having a dunking the dad game where the, we have a group of dads who have nominated to be the dunkies and the mums and kids get to line up and throw the balls and see how many times they can get them in the water. And of course we've taken it from there. We also have events for the kids themselves. We're going to have a slip and slide, a bouncy castle for the younger kids and an obstacle course for the older kids. But of course this all costs money. Um, I, with the Eden Hill Dads Group, I really don't like going back to the PNC because the money is raised through the PNC is meant to go back into the school for the school um, improvements where they need to make the shortfall between what the Department of Education gives them and what is actually required. So in this case, I've asked, uh, after meeting up with uh, Salvatore at a recent workshop, I came up with the proposal of submitting a grant application for this. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask Jeremy some questions? How long is the picnic for? We're doing it for three hours. We've got some food trucks and things coming along as well. Um, we're encouraging people to bring their, any of their own games or balls or frisbees and we've also spoken to um, Old Perth Road Collective about borrowing some of their sort of giant lawn games and things like that just to fill out the oval a little bit more on it as well. Looks like you're off the hook easily. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming presenting and thank you for all the great work that you're doing in Thanks. our community. Thank you. really appreciate it and make a big difference, I think. <laughs> so um, your item is somewhat further down on the agenda, so you're very welcome to stay for the meeting <coughs> or you're welcome to leave and you'll be informed of the council decision. Right. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so next, um, also in relation to item 10.8, we have Paul Quick and Judy Hood, and husband, <laughs> um, here from the Morley Baptist Church, who have also requested um, funding um, for $2,000 for a Christmas festival that they're proposing in December. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight. really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Paul Quick, I'm the new lead pastor at Morley Baptist Church. Uh, Judy Hood is one of the pastoral staff, uh, ministry team leader. Morley Baptist Church is tucked away in Hanwell Way, a little cul-de-sac uh, just behind Collier Road. 
and we are running a Christmas festival on Sunday the 8th of December, so a week prior to the Bassendine Christmas Festival. Uh, we put in an application for up to $2,000. Uh, the evening will start from about 5, go through to 9. I understand you've got the, the printout of our application, but just to uh, clarify, uh, it's uh, multicultural, it's intergenerational, it's community focused. Uh, we normally will get upwards of 600 people. Uh, there'll be activities, there'll be food stalls, and then there'll be carol singing. So we would really appreciate the $2,000 uh, funding if possible. I feel bad coming here and the first time I'm here I'm actually asking for something. We'd much rather be <laughs> offering to give something, but nevertheless, <laughs> be it as it is. Uh, but the 2000 would help us significantly to meet budget and to be able to put on the event. So just for the benefit of others, I have met Paul previously and in that conversation he was very much offering, not asking, so I, I don't think you need to be concerned there. Um, any questions for Paul and Judy? I take it that um, it'll be members of the um, Bassendine community as well as members from Bayswater being here on the very you're on the boundary, aren't you? So you'll get people coming from both areas. So, are you um, are you applying to Bayswater as well for assistance? I don't think we are. No. That's a good point, but I think we are actually inside the Bassendine line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were actually on, right on the boundary. But on that on that basis, you know, probably people from Bayswater will come. I'm sure they would. Yeah, good point. Um, we yeah. do have um, like the Anzac Terrace Primary School coming and singing some songs, and different dance <coughs> groups coming from the area coming and doing <coughs> dances. And um, the Chin Burmese Church that's just up from us, they're coming as well and, and doing some activities and right. things yeah. as well. So, so it's very multicultural. Yeah. How are you planning to advertise it so that it's broadly known by the wider community? Well, we've got signs up. <laughs> and we've, we're having an electronic sign come the week before, but they cost three hundred and fifty dollars for a week. So, um, and advertise on radio on um, is it ninety six FM Christian Sunshine Radio? Advertised on that. Yeah, and um, social media. And social media on Facebook, and we have got. I have got, um, I don't know if anybody wants any, but I have got um, flyers that people have handed out. So we, you can all have one if you'd like. <laughs> Do you use the local um, Facebook pages, the community pages, like 6054 and so on? I haven't heard of that. so Because that's probably worth letting you know about, because that's got around 7,000, I think. What's it called? It's the 6054. It's so called Bash St Dean, Ashfield, Eden Hill, something like that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, but that's, that's a really fine. good free way yeah. of getting the message out to a broad section of the community. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so it's primarily a, a Carol's by Candlelight event? It is primarily. It, yeah. two, two hours before is like children's activities. At the same time there's food for people to have. So we have our car park is all set out with um, tables and chairs and um, big carpet area for people to sit on and watch the, if, if, they're not, if they're not into the younger generation of doing all the bouncy castle and bungee run and face painting and stuff, they can just sit and watch what's happening on, on the stage of the kids dancing or singing or whatever. And a, a lot of them just come and have a meal together as a family from the, the food trucks or whatever we, we're, we provide. We sell a lot of hot chips. <laughs> They're very popular. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then from 7 o'clock till um, about 8.30 is the carols. And Father Christmas comes before the carol start. And, and this is so a week before the other yes. carols by candlelight event yes. that we're also providing sponsorship funding for is, is happening. So we'll have two consecutive yeah. carols yeah. by candlelight. Yeah. Okay. Has there ever been, I think I spoke to you about this when we first met, like has there ever been a conversation between the two to come together and support each other in an event? No. Worth having. Yeah, yeah, it would be really good. We, we, we were just made aware when we first moved into the area that there was a carol event and so we shouldn't be treading on their toes. So we made sure we wouldn't do it on the same day. So that's why it's on a separate day so that you can go to two if you like. <laughs> Yes, Sarah. Councillor Quinton and then Councillor Hamilton. Um, I 
think from conversations you run other groups that use your facilities, will they all be invited to this event? Okay, because I know you have a lot of carers that bring um, mm -hmm. a lot of um, disadvantaged yes. and disabled people, so mm -hmm. that would be good. Mm -hmm. And to Councillor Quinton. Uh, just wondering, um, I'm sure you're aware of our no single-use plastics policy. Mm -hmm. um, what the candles get put in, because I know that they've got those uh, plastic candle holders. Oh, they're, that would they're be um, that would be considered a single-use plastic. So I'm just wondering they're how battery operated. Oh, you got yeah, the battery yeah. operated yeah. ones, perfect, because yeah. they're reusable. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, just for my benefit, what are some other disadvantaged groups that would be invited along to the event? Um, the men should have um, disabled people come to that, so I'm not sure exactly what their disabilities are, but they're invited to come, so yeah. Anyone's invited to come. <laughs> and welcome. Thank you very much. I think that's everyone's questions. Um, really appreciate you coming tonight to answer them. And um, as I said before, the matter will be um, decided a bit later in tonight's agenda. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I told you we'd be nice. <laughs> can I just ask the two ladies by the door? I can just hear you talking. It's not finding it difficult. Sorry. Um, and now we have Lisa Donnie, who's representing the Bassendine Galaxy Basketball Club. Um, who has requested $2,000 to assist with uniforms and equipment. So welcome. And this is Mari Kessel, the Secretary. Yes. Secretary. So um, I'm the Vice President of the Bastion Galaxy Basketball Club. We started the club last year with two teams that wanted to put in uh, a team, one boy team and one girl team. And by the time we got to the point of submission, we had enough interest from parents within the community to actually put in six teams for last summer. And over winter that grew to eight teams. And some of the girls left to go and play netball, and some of the boys who had been playing cricket came back to play basketball. Um, and now this coming summer season, as we've just begun, we've actually had enough interest from the community and the players to actually have 13 teams from the club. So we are very grateful that we've had such a lot of interest in the club, but it's put a lot of financial pressure on us as a club to suddenly expand from what was originally a very small start-up club to now suddenly doubling in size within a 12-month period. So one of the things that's come up at the moment is that obviously we have to wear a uniform for the club. We had secured funding last year with some sponsorship through Hawaiian. Um, we haven't managed to secure that this year, but we still have to purchase six extra sets of uniforms, um, and the cost for those is $1,858. We are still in discussions with Hawaiian, but they haven't committed as to whether or not they're going to add any additional funding towards those uniforms. In addition, we've had to buy additional balls and training kits for those extra teams and so that they could start because the season had already started for us and the cost of those is $1,908. And we're also um, trying to get some first aid kits and some coaching boards for our coaches so that they can actually, um, I don't know if any of you have seen a basketball coaching board, they actually have a little summary of the court and you can talk through the plays on the board and the coach can actually explain to the kids what things that they would like them to do on the court. Um, the cost for those at the moment is estimated to be $1,300. And the final thing that we're hoping to do as a club this year is to put our coaches through some coaching courses. So there's a community coaching course that's offered through Basketball WA and they're $40 per coach. We have 13 coaches and two assistant coaches. So again, the cost for that is approximately $600. At the moment, we've had to purchase the uniforms because we haven't had a choice, the kids have to actually physically be in something when they're on the court. Um, we have delayed the purchase of some of the other things whilst we're trying to work out how we can fund those. We've held just recently a sausage sizzle at Bunnings to assist um, in some of our funding efforts and potentially we'll be holding another one in February, March next year to again try to put some money back into the club 
But what we're hoping as a club is that we can maintain our fee structure in such a way that we don't have to keep reaching out to the parents in the community. We have a number of families who have multiple children, one family with four, a number of families with three. So for them to be forking out additional money for all three of their children comes at a fairly high cost. We are at the moment competitive in terms of our fees. We're not the cheapest, we're not the most expensive, but we're also very mindful that a number of our players are from a lower socioeconomic background and we don't want to be increasing those fees if we can help it. So we're hoping that we might be able to get a grant that will actually help subsidise some of the costs of running the club. Thank you. I first heard about um, your club on Australia Day this year when there was an award for, what's the gentleman's name? Oh, Boyd Lacay, yes. he's our president. Yes, and um, it sounds like you've been doing amazing things in a short period of time. It's great to hear about some of them. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask about the application? Councilor Biden? I was just wondering in regards to the, the coaches that you have at the club. Are they uh, parents, siblings, teenagers? Um, we have, uh, of the 13 coaches, we have uh, 10 who are parents, um, mostly. Well, actually, no, sorry, two, no. nine who are parents. Um, we have two who are under 16s who are coaching the younger grades, so we're trying to build up their involvement and their skills. Um, we've actually been really lucky to have someone from, so we're part of the East Perth Association, and um, one of the ladies who was part of that, she's played competitively at state and she's coached at state level, has put her hand up to reach out to a club that needs some additional coaching in some of the women's teams. So she's now joined this year and she's coaching one of the under 14 girls team and her daughter, who's also a state player, is coaching an under 12 girls team for us. So yeah, we're really lucky that we've got a lot of volunteers in those roles. But other than um, Julie and her daughter, the rest of our coaches haven't had any experience <coughs> other than generally sitting on the sidelines. So the first part of the coaching program that we'd like to assist them with is the community coaches course, which is the $40 course. We had expressed interest from two coaches who would like to take it to that next level. And that will be something that you know we'll discuss as a club over time. But we want to retain those coaches as well because they play themselves. Um, so the two of the older players and a number of the dads slash coaches have formed their own team on a Monday night. They're not officially <coughs> representing the club, but it's become quite a social thing for the men there as well through the club. Thanks. Councillor Quinton also had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, how many kids have you got in the club now? What's the, to what's the number of kids? 10, 120. Because we've just had three new join this week. So. <laughs> 130 kids. Okay. And you talked before about um, lots of kids from low socioeconomic backgrounds. What are, what's the what's your process when they come to the club in order? Because I read in your application that you don't turn anyone away. So can you explain to me what that process is when a family or a kid comes and says that they want to play? So we, the first thing we have to do because of registration for insurance is they all have to pay a $30 fee with Basketball WA. Uh, last year we had a number of children who couldn't do that at the time. They are not allowed to take the court without doing that. So the club subsidised that fee for a few of those players so that they could actually get out there and get on the court. And through the, um, I, I think the first season you can explain tell me whether this happened but uh, we've now applied through kids sport so we're registered through kids sport so the children who are um, eligible for that can actually have access to that funding and to assist I don't know if we did that the very first season we were so and um, so there's a number of parents who have actually reached out to say that they couldn't pay up front, that could they pay a certain portion now, and when the rest of their kids sport voucher come through, could they pay the rest later on? So there has been that scenario for some families. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. How much do they get under kids sport? It's 200 a year, and um, not allowed to go towards uniforms, but if they do any other particular sport, that will get divvied up between the sport. And so, for example, if a child plays basketball and netball, that 200 is capped out, so they either use it for one or the other, or they allocate $100 to one and $100 to another. Um, we've also had, um, through the last winter season, um, a particular family who were unable to afford the fees, so they have um, just been subsidised by the club. Okay, and um, in terms of their uniform, so the $200 from Kids Sport, does that cover their fees? 
And their insurance to play? No. So the insurance is thirty dollars per child, and that goes straight to Basketball WA. Yep. So we don't actually have any access to but that. But they funds. can use their two hundred dollars to pay for that, or uh, they just get it put in their bank account and they pay you the thirty bucks. No, it work? has to go through to a club, so right. they can't use that for that thirty dollars. Uh -huh. So the club fees for us are two hundred dollars. So two hundred twenty if you have one child, two hundred for the second child, and then one hundred eighty for the third and subsequent children. So we scale that for those families that have additional. So if they only have one child, that two hundred dollars they would have to top up the extra twenty themselves. Or if they have a child like some do who play winter and then into summer, then they might have 200 allocated in the first one and then they have to find the rest of their money themselves in the second season or they might choose to split that to balance their budget. And does that um, fee include their uniforms? Yes. So the club owns all the uniforms, um, as I've discovered as in the last year or so. Um, basketball is quite different to a number of other sports in that uniforms all have to have a number represented on them. And if a child had a uniform that they had a particular number on and then the next season they got put into another team, and there's two people with the same number, you can't both take the court at the same time. So the club owns all the uniforms, we loan them out to players then um, they, in theory, return them at the end of the season. We've had, unfortunately, um, a few not be returned from players who didn't return back to the club. So then we have to re replace those as well. We don't charge for the hire of that. We generally try to make sure that they come back. Um, but we also make sure at the moment that uh, players don't have, they buy their shorts. So we just have a plain black short, so like a $5 Kmart short, so that the additional expense is not back through to the place. Sorry, I've got one more question. Okay, and then Councillor Hamilton. Do you have an end of year event? We do. Um, because we have two seasons, we actually have two end of year events. So after the first summer season, we went to Basewater Waves, and the kids had a bit of a swim, and we put on a sausage sizzle. And at the end of the winter season, we organised a walk up through John National Park. So we all met at the bottom um, where the train tunnel is. I don't know if those of you who are familiar with that, and walked up in a group, and then a number of us drove in to the top level with supplies, and we put on um, a burger and hamburger um, event. How much did those events cost you? That one was approximately five hundred dollars, including medals and a laminated photo for each player. For both events or for each event? Um, Base would have went was around about. We had a um, nice smaller club, um, base order work was approximately $500 in hi uh, for hiring inflatables, for the medals, for the photos, for the food. And so next year, your event's going to be bigger because you've got more kids, it's going to cost more, potentially. We're budgeting for about 800 Per event? $800 for the club, for the wind up. So Councillor yeah. Hamilton's question. Thank you. Okay. Um, given how busy you are and how your growth is so speedy, have you given thought to um, how to progress yourself into the future so that you become more sustainable? Because obviously um, rapid growth can actually also be a problem. Um, so my question is, have you explored through the Department of Sport and, and places like that whether you can get ongoing assistance of any description, um, all these avenues? to facilitate your future expansion so that you can become quite sustainable in the future? Um, I have logged onto their website yes. and I've located where their grant section is yes. and, and I have started to peruse how to go about that process but we haven't actually put in the applications as yet. Not necessarily grant, maybe <coughs> phone calls just to get tips on what how. To do. Because, you know, it sounds like you're uh, providing some good deeds in the community, um, but I do know that usually when you have such rapid expansion, mm -hmm. it can create lots of pressures, um, especially if key people sort of leave. So it would be advantageous to put feelers out, but I'm glad that you're actually thinking ahead of the game. That's excellent to hear. Yeah, in fact, we have a um, committee meeting on Thursday that's on the agenda. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions people would like to ask? Thank you for your time, ladies. Thank Appreciate you, so you being much. here. Thank you.
And um, finally, um, item 10.9, we have Nella Fitzgerald um, to speak upon the amendment um, proposed for her funding application for the 2020 Wonder Realm. Yes, just have to declare an interest on this uh, item impartiality interest and leave the room. I need to leave the room for an impartiality. Not for a deputation. No, dude, it's, uh, it's an unbiased. It's not. I can't be unbiased in uh, in my my personal friendship with um, oh. the application. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can still stay. Oh, can I stay for the deputation? For the deputation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought I thought I just better, better, better safe than sorry. Just don't give her a hard time, John. <laughs> oh, he does any other time. So please, let's not be different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nella. Thank you, and your worship, the mayor, and councillors. Feel free to take a seat if you'd be more comfortable. I'll, I'll, I'll after my greeting, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and the staff of the town of Dean, thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. Okay, um, so, oh, I feel taller standing up, don't I? <laughs> uh, oh, your worship, sorry. Um, so, uh, I have requested uh, perhaps to have the well, for the wording to be amended for uh, Wonder Realm. Um, oh, first of all, I believe there was the up to $50,000 that um, was put forward, but it was actually the grant was for 50. And the problem on signing off with up to is that it could be any amount thereafter. So um, it's not sitting comfortably for me or fringe. So I you know, I'm welcome for anyone to explain it further, but um, I'm not well, with all of my dealings of artists that I've brought that have been very highly accomplished artists from overseas, um, it's something that I would never have had in an agreement with any anyone funding the event. It's very simple, I'm not comfortable. Uh, and what about um, the second part of that? Yes. So about the logistics infrastructure market? Yes. Oh, and thank you for that, my right. worship. Um, <clears throat> the reason, uh, when I had applied for the grant, it was, I had put forward 25,000 for the entertainment, 20,000 for logistics, wherever I can make it work really well for the money, and 5,000 for fringe advertising, which is very expensive and even though Outrage is a not-for-profit um, the truth of the matter is fringe does cost a lot of money to be part of um, so with that in mind I felt that if I had presented those figures that way if I could get something a lot less than it can go always towards entertainment because with my brand um, anyone that's been to the events or uh, past events will know that it always goes towards entertainment I don't like to just have the stage and all the things associated with it there and there's limited entertainment or not of the caliber that I would love to bring to my community um, and uh, for our, our newly elected councillors, um, in case you're not aware of my background, I have bought um, site plus little Domingo um, to Australia. I've done a lot of very big events. Um, my passion lies in community. Uh, now I've done all of that, and um, whilst I, I loved it, um, it's great for me to always help artists in WA and to bring to my community the very best that I can uh, with as much money as I can get for it. <laughs> so, um, if need be, I have here some uh, things for you to peruse. Um, what's important to Fringe and myself, and I'm sure all of you, is, well, particularly for me, I was really proud that uh, Wonder Realm, uh, we did win the award for Best in State. Um, which wasn't even thought of or expected, so that was great for our community. But what is wonderful, I have the impact report from Fringe, and they have recognised Superlicious and Wonder Realm as uh, being very important for other councils to come on board and do Fringe. So I just marked it with my Telstra Fashion Festival. So it's on that page there that it's actually that's been distributed to many areas. And um, yes, on the right, 
counsellor. And that is just a wonderful thing. And to me, it's not about just putting on an event. I will fight passionately, as anyone will attest, to bringing the very best artists that I can here, just to show that Bassendine is on level with any of the other councils that have a lot more funding. And um, by amending that, I would be most grateful because then if I can save on one area, I will put it towards more entertainment and particularly because it's a free entry. Um, I don't want that people think, oh, it'll be just whatever I can find. It is really top, top artists in every which way that we can. And also I'll always put more towards the children's entertainment, which I'm very passionate about. Yes, I think we all know you have very high standards, Nella. And, oh, thank um, you, Your Worship. And, <laughs> congratulations and as I on your should award for, again last year. Yes, thank so. you. Well, it's all of our award because without the Town of Bassendine and the councillors that voted to give the funding and the staff that, you know, um, put it forth, uh, we couldn't have won that award. The award, okay, it has my name on it, but it's not me. It's, it's every one of them, and especially for our younger people that they can see Bassendine is a really amazing place to be in. And it, it's it's more than just putting on an event for me. It's about bringing people together, and they're not just pretty words. I really mean it with all my heart. It's bringing people together and showing them that everything, anything is possible if you dream, you know. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean Bassin dream, but <laughs> now that I've said it, that is a good point. And, like and it is, and you can only show that by Showing people that, yes, you will fight to bring the very best for them. And I want people to feel proud of being in Bassendine, and, and they are. And, you know, as I say, I will passionately advocate Thank you, for Helen. the best I can give to my community. Well, let's just see if anybody has any questions for you. Councillor Barty. I'm just wondering with the uh, rise of, of diagnoses of, of autism in our community, a number of community events and yes. large community organisations are making spaces accessible for people with autism by providing things like quiet hours or uh, uh, cool down rooms and sensory yeah. maps and those sorts of things. Um, has consideration been given for adding that sort of thing? Yes, to it has now? actually, because um, I was working on the disability inclusion plan and um, I did read up extensively on that. And um, like normally you would think disability would be people in wheelchairs with afflictions, uh, vision impaired, but it's also in that inclusion plan is mums, dads with prams, young children, children with uh, that have the challenge of autism or visual. And with that in mind, I spoke with Martin Jane, our famous uh, sculptor here in Bassendine, and he has very kindly offered to bring uh, some particular items that I saw, like the rhinoceros and the big daddy bag on Old Perth Road as you go to Guildford Bridge. And we're going to um, have a whole, the other side of Old Perth Road will be like a garden, I'll come up with a more glamorous name um, um, and we'll have all of the tactile and then there'll be a quiet area where people can go and just sit and, and relax. So I have considered that and I will make it, it, it's a goal of mine and I've spoken to Salvatore Siciliano and uh, Gabriella Filippi and they're very much aware of those plans that I looked at about uh, six weeks ago. I believe I discussed it with you at the, um, the last meeting. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. Does anybody Thank have any questions worship. specifically related to the funding? Um, Are you changing your mind? <laughs> no, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, I, I thought you said something about um, free, but I, I'm sure in the documents there's ticketed events, yes. which I think it's the first year you're doing that, isn't it? Correct, that? but all of the funding is being used for the free event. Uh, the ticketed um, I will be funding or, um, you know, O2 I no, brought in. Yeah, the Pardon? ticketed event at O2 last time. Yeah. Yes, we yes, we did, but I didn't receive oh, money from that yeah. because I wanted people to hear about Passendine, so I um, got them to be involved and also the artist, uh, they had all the ticketed monies. Mm. But any of the funding that I have requested will not be used for the ticketed events. So Councillor McWilliam? Um, no, I just wanted to ask if, um, yes. I know 
I've got a niece that's heavily involved in French. Um, yes. Works with them, but she said uh, to me that they use a lot of volunteers, so much so that people don't get, it's really hard to get a job with French because they get so many volunteers. Are well, you able to access the volunteers? I have been asking for volunteers. Yeah. I did approach the um, in the town of Bassendine, waiting to hear from them. I've also spoken to the SES, um, who will hopefully okay, come yeah. in. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. And um, oh, actually I spoke with Bill, so they're helping. Bob Bob Brown has actually, he came up to me and said he's volunteering um, to help, so at his peril. <laughs> but it, look, the, the, the facts are, councillor, that it is not easy to get volunteers mm -hmm. if it's not Fringe Central. Mm -hmm. right, okay. That Just is the yeah. absolute fact. and. What I'm endeavouring to do is show that to build um, Wonder Realm Bassendine, the town of Bassendine, as the place to be. It takes a lot of time to do that, uh, but you are competing with Fringe Central where most volunteers want to see, you know, everything that's happening there. So I am doing my best, believe me. No, I know, I trust you. If anyone <laughs> would like to volunteer, please <laughs> see me afterwards. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, not as um it is a challenge to get them yeah thank you any thank further you questions all right well, we appreciate your time now thank we you, are just many of us looking forward to wonder realm again next thank year. you so much it's going to be fabulous i'm sure it will oh, yeah <laughs> thank you very much it's exciting thank you so much your worship <laughs> councillors our staff thanks nella thank you thank you, thank you very much so councillors, moving on with the meeting, um, we're up to item five, which is the confirmation of previous minutes. So first of all, considering that ordinary council meeting held in October prior to the elections. So do I have a mover that the minutes of the meeting be received? Councillor Gangel has moved. Is there a seconder? Councillor Wilson. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Um, and 5.1b that they are an accurate record with Councillor Gangel has moved that, seconded by Councillor Barty. Is there anybody against? All those in favour? Carried unanimously, thank you. 5.2 is referring to the special council meeting held on the 22nd of October. Um, 5.2a of a mover that the minutes be received. Councillor Gangel moved, seconded by myself. Anybody against? All those in favour? I think that's carried unanimously, is it Councillor Barty? Oh, you're yep. Correct. And 5.2b, that the minutes are an accurate record. Moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded Councillor Gangel. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. Item 6, um, announcements by the presiding person. So I mentioned this at the briefing session, but just wanted to acknowledge Councillor Wilson's recent appointment as chair of the EMRC. Congratulations. Um, we have no petitions, so moving on to item 8, which is declarations of interest. We've had two received so far. So the first is for Councillor Quinton, oh sorry, three Councillor Gangel. Second is for Councillor Quinton, and that's in relation to item 10.8, the community grants, um, particularly for the Galaxy Basketball Club. And Councillor Hamilton, I'm here, I'm sorry, Councillor Quinton, I'm here, we've got impartiality, but I think we can read this indirect financial. Yes. You happy if I change that? Yes. Um, we also have had a declaration of impartiality from Councillor Gansh for 10.9, the Wonder yes, Realm application, you. and also impartiality interest for myself in relation to 10.8, which is the Eden Hill Dads Group, because my husband is a member of the committee of the Eden Hill Dads Group um, committee. Um, so, Councillor, I, when we get to the item for 10.8, I believe Councillor Clinton would like us to consider whether or not her interest is substantial enough for her to be excluded, but we'll do that when we come to that item if everyone's happy with that. Any other declarations of interest that I'm not aware of yet? Councillor Ganger, can you just make sure you fill out the form um, at the end of the meeting as well? That would be great. Oh, okay. I thought I just had to state it at the meeting. We have to do both. Okay. Um, okay, so item 9 um, is business deferred, which there is none. So moving on to item 10, 10.1 um, is the adoption of recommendations on the block. So councillors, just letting you know which ones I have coming out. And if you have any additional, if you can please let me know. So at the moment I've had 10.2, um, 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, 10.6, 10.7,
and 13.1. Is there anything that somebody oh. would like to? Yes, Councillor Ganja? Yeah, um, it says 12.1. Oh, that's an error. Oh, in that's an okay. It's Thank you. 11.1. Thank sorry. you very much. Yep. Um, Councillor Hamilton? 10.5. So 10.5, the Community Safety and Crime Prevention Update. Yep. So for our new councillors, if there's anything on there that you have a question about, um, you need to um, request it to come out now, otherwise we won't get the opportunity. And if there's anything you'd like to have a um, vote against or have an alternative or amendment, you also need to bring that out now. Councillor Wilson. 10.13. Uh, 10.13, which is the Town Assets Committee meeting. Councillor Barty, are you happy? Councillor McWilliam, okay. All right, if there's nothing additional, then can I have a mover for the remainder to be carried on block? So Councillor Ganjo has moved. Is there a seconder? Councillor Quinton, anybody against? All those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Thank you, so moving on to item 10 point. So. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, what? Have you got a question? Uh, I do. About um, non block? Well, it, it relates to whether item 10.8 would remain as item 10.8 or would become 13.2. Uh, oh, so I, I thought maybe when we got to that point in the agenda, we could decide whether or not we were going to have that as a confidential item. So we, thank you. All right, so going back on to um, the reports that weren't taken on blocks. So the first one is 10.2, which relates to the Point Reserve Jetties update. And councillors would remember that last week the staff provided an update for us. Um, but today there was some information received. So there's been an update circulated quite late this afternoon. But maybe I can ask Mr Adams to speak to the updated information for the benefit of councillors and the community members present. Hopefully you've got an updated sheet in front of you. Thanks for that. Um, through the chair, I just don't want to go over old ground, but um, just to cover off on the events that's led us to where we are now. Um, on Monday morning, the um, I got a, I got a call to uh, do a further inspection of the jetty after we'd started works down there. Um, we could confirm that the. Um, first two piers, as per the, the note in the report, um, were termite infested, but it um, now appears that the rest of the jetty is not. Um, I was there while they undertook a further inspection and um, um, we need to do further work to satisfy ourselves that um, there's no risk um, with the, the current materials and the the uh, infestation of the uh, termites. So sorry to interrupt, but just to clarify, you're referring to the South Jetty at the moment? South Jetty, sorry. Yeah. So does anybody have questions about the current status? Councillor Hamilton? Um, I just wanted to ask a question. I, I did send an email, but I don't believe I've got a response where I noted that um, that there is the a date. Is there yeah, the concern? dates because DBCA require um, confirmation of timelines for replacement of North Jetty by the 14th of December. Now OCM isn't until the 17th of December, so I'm just not sure how we're dealing with that. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, I've made contact with the DBCA staff to seek a week extension to allow the matter to fall on the other side of the council meeting. Uh, I'm yet to receive a response, but as soon as I do, I'll convey that to uh, Peter and all councillors. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Ganjo? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, last week at the briefing session, I did mention that I had contact with an artist who wanted to use uh, the timber slats. Uh, for potentially an art project in the town of Bassendine. Uh, following that meeting, I subsequently then saw the CEO uh, and pri provided her with the contact details of the artist. Uh, I just note there's nothing mentioned in the report in relation to that. The CEO did advise that uh, she would contact the artist and actually include it as part of the report coming to council. Yeah. Yes, <coughs> I was um, a bit concerned, I guess, about 
some of the mixed messages around the jetty, so I've kept it out purposely of, of the report tonight. But the wood that's been salvaged from North Jetty is now being stored at the depot. Um, so I understand the way termites work is that once they've been taken away from their, their home, the colony breaks up. So the wood is at the depot and we thought as a sort of second tranche of work we would then look at how we could maybe repurpose some of that wood uh, for the purposes of artwork and so on. But the contact details have been provided to the Executive Manager Infrastructure and I've asked him to contact the artist just to advise of where we're at in the stage of the removal of the wood. Okay, so can I ask uh, approximately time frame in relation to that? probably in the next few weeks, I think we could. Okay. And a report will come back to Council? On That's the, right, so yep. there's another report coming in December and I think for the December meeting we could address the repurposing of the salvaged wood. Yep. And yep. just um, when you're ready, Your Worship, I have an amendment that I'd like to suggest um, be debated for including in the substantive motion. Okay. Um, just following on from that, um, Subject matter. Um, the wood being, used the wood being termite infested and the termites dissipating. That depends where their nest is. If their nest is existing in some of the wood that's been taken mm. away, then that's where they'll go. So, so does anyone know where the nest is? Because I thought it was very hard to find nests. Yeah. I, I think in any event, as a preventative measure, it will be um, sprayed. Yeah. So with the wood going to another home, is it possible to get a, a release from any liability if yes. termites happen yes. to that would occur in order to travel? Any further questions about the item? Yes. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So in the Officer Recommendation 10.2, uh, uh, it discusses uh, a permit that's being sought uh, for works uh, on the North Jetty. Um, seems as uh, we are still undertaking environmental assessment on the South Jetty. Would it make sense to apply for permits for both jetties at the same time? The permits can be obtained fairly quickly. Um, I guess what we haven't yet done is the further integrity, the structural integrity testing of the South Jetty. So um, we've had three different reports as to its status and it has varied based on individual sort of drilling and testing along the, the various uh, lengths of the jetty. So I guess we're waiting at this stage for a further uh, report and that will give us the status of that jetty and we hope to update council at the December meeting on that one. So if, if it proves, I guess in terms of the structure of the two jetties, the south jetty its pylons are not as strong as the North Jetty. So as a um, you know, foundation, North Jetty is still superior to South. So yes, you might be able to remedy some of the, the, the planks and so on on the South Jetty, but um, it may not have the same asset life cycle as the North Jetty, um, if that makes sense. Um, are, th are there any costs involved with the applying for such a permit, uh, permit from DVCA? I don't believe there are any cost implications. And there are things that we can act on fairly quickly once we've got the information. So I imagine Council um, Wilson is potentially proposing to apply for a permit for both in the event that we are able to do some work on the South Jetty, is that yes. what you're suggesting? Do it once, do it properly. Yeah. Would there be any problems with that being included in the motion? Uh, certainly, but I think there would be an expectation that we would look to reinstate both within a specified time period and provide that information. So I guess the question is, uh, is Council ready to make that decision that it wants to progress South Jetty at this stage? Yes. Question Thank you for queuing me, Your Worship. If I could just read my suggested amendment, which would become point three, that Council commits to the reinstatement of the South Jetty in recognition of the history and uniqueness of the two jetties 
to the town of Bassendale. Sorry, can you please read that again? That so count a point four, is it? So it will be well, sort of go with point three, as I think. But at point four, whatever, yes, it'll be it'll be another point to the uh, to the officer recommendation that council commits to the reinstatement of the South Jetty in recognition of the history and uniqueness of the two jetties to the town of Bassendine. Okay, so you're moving the officer recommendation to that fourth point. Amy, do you have that recorded? Well, no, I'm hoping to move that as, as an amendment, and if it gets up, it can become part of the substantive. So we, we need to have someone move the substantive motion first and then deal with amendments. So, oh, I'm so, happy to so, move you move, so yep. you're moving the substantive yep. for the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder for the yes. officer recommendation? the opportunity to ask questions, um, Well, let's just see if there's a seconder first and then you can ask a question. Can we ask more questions? Yes. yes. So, <laughs> um, Jay, you want to ask first? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so just on page 8 of 81 on the agenda, um, it talks about communication and engagement. And it says that the town informed the community about the deteriorating states of the jetty in and around November. Um, uh, via the town's website and Facebook. The primary focus of communications at this stage has been on safety risks and the unsafe state of the jetties. Um, I observed, well, the, the first I knew about the issue with the jetties was when I saw um, a report on Friday and then the following Monday there was a, a Facebook post from the town which uh, said that we would be fair well in the jetties. And I'm just wondering how uh, a public statement from the town saying that we are fair well in the jetties sits with the comment here in the officer report that talks about the safety risks of the jetty. So on the 8th of November, we received advice from the maintenance contractor that both jetties were unsafe, unsafe and needed to be closed, and also advice from LGIS, our insurer, um, to take immediate action in terms of the safety risk and hazard that it presented to, to the public. As a CEO, in terms of my functions and the operational day-to-day -day management of the asset, I took action to uh, advise council, but also advise the community in that regard. And it was about alerting the alert alerting the community to the safety risk and there was a, um, uh, I guess a more detailed post that appeared on our website and then there was the, the, the sort of abridged Facebook message as well. Uh, so uh, on, on the, the Facebook post from the town that said that we would be farewelling the jetties, um, there was considerable debate and public commentary uh, including uh, some rather unflattering comments about councils and the decision uh, that people had inferred that councillors had made. Um, those comments weren't clarified in a way that disabused the people that this was a decision the council had made to remove the jetties and I'm just wondering why that is the case. Yeah. I guess um, from time to time the community does get confused between the role of town, the town, the administration and council uh, and there have been other occasions where council decisions have been made and staff have been subject to uh, community backlash mm -hmm. but it's probably not the appropriate time to defend or uh, you know, come across as potentially divisive when the community is in, in such a state, um, it can actually escalate the situation. So wherever possible, we were trying to provide constructive responses to the community and try and dissipate the situation. And, and how do you think that strategy went? Did well, I think following the statement I provided at the briefing <coughs> session, things have certainly calmed down. So I think in explaining the actions that were taken, and explaining that public safety was the primary risk. Um, a lot of that situation, the, the heat has just gone from the situation. So Councillor Hamilton also had a question. Still, I don't know what the Councillor Hamilton asked us. Um, <coughs> Obviously, the administration receives some variable advice on those jetties, the condition of the jetties. Um, 
So my question is, um, how do we, into the future, ensure that we are getting more accurate advice from these outside entities that are employed by the town to provide what we would hope and expect mm. is accurate advice. But that, that that seems to have not been the case. So so does the town has the town reflected on how we might perhaps assess some of these entities that are providing that advice to try and get better advice in the future? I think, I think there's a couple of issues there. One is uh, around termite infestations and the difficulty in detecting the extent of termites. Uh, and that's certainly been the situation in this case. Um, we've had, based upon different tests that have been carried out um, across both jetties, um, initially North Jetty was you know, considered the, the worst in terms of its deteriorated state. Uh, and then a further report was no South Jetty is worse and it could be 75% uh, impacted. Now that situation has now evolved since they've done further drilling. So they actually have to pull apart the jetty and they often do drilling in certain areas to identify termite damage. Um, but until you start taking it apart, um, you don't know the full extent. So they've done a number of different tests to try and understand the extent of the termite damage. I think North Jetty, when they started taking it apart, it was riddled with termites, like they were running, running as the, the wood was coming off. South Jetty, I think up until the um, third um, pier, um, certainly there was evidence of termites. It then seemed to cease, but I understand that there was some evidence at the end so we don't know the true extent yet of South G, um, and it needs some further integrity testing. So there is termite damage there. Can South Jetty recover from the termite damage that's in existence through removing the wood that's affected and replacing it? I don't know, and that's why further testing is required. But at the moment, we've got North Jetty that's effectively just pylons with metal beams coming through them. So it's effectively no longer a jetty. And South Jetty, which has um, been removed uh, up to a certain point, and I guess further testing is now required on that. So it, it is very difficult, and even the maintenance contractors have commented how difficult it is to identify and diagnose the extent of termite damage. So um, it, it's, it's one of those issues that I don't think there's a, um, you know, a you know, uh, a silver bullet in terms of responding. Um, thank you for that. I, I just had concerns that, you know, um, as the town is employing experts, you know, I just had concerns with the variable nature of the responses, so I just needed to have some clarity on that. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Uh, so, in relation to um, office recommendation at point one there, where it says um, the council note the actions taken to date by the town administration, um, would it be more accurate to describe that as um, actions taken by the CEO um, under, how is it described, okay. delegated authority? Or uh, what, what's the, the mechanism by which? It's under yes. Section 5 of the Local Government Act, the CEO's functions, day-to-day -day yes. operations. Yes. So just, just for the purposes of clarity um, as a way of, I guess, uh, making the situation slightly less confused, would that be uh, a more accurate form of voice? It's not delegated authority, though, no, is it? This is the CEO's authority independent of council. Yes. Under Section 5 of the Local Government Act. Yes. Uh, authority that rests with the CEO. Is that the case? Yes. Yeah. Actions taken to date by the CEO. Yes. Okay, so if there's no further questions, we've had Councillor Gangel um, indicate his intention to move the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder for the officer recommendation? Sorry, is that to in, we, and then we'll are we changing that to, to date by the CEO? Okay, so Do we need to okay. formally change that or is that just a given? So, Councillor Gangel, mm, you were wanting to move the officer recommendation. You're happy with the CEO included yep. there instead mm -hmm. of the town administration? Yep. 
And you were also wishing to add in a point four, which you read out earlier. Yes, which I'm happy to have debated as yes. an amendment. Does anybody yeah. um, need that fourth point read out? Yes. Yes, yes thank you. And would you mind reading that out? Oh, have you got it there? Yeah. Yeah. That the council commits to the reinstatement of the South Jetty in recognition of the history and uniqueness of the two jetties to the town of Bassendane. Okay. Do you have a question? <coughs> um, can we just see before we ask questions if there's a seconder for the Councillor Quinton? Yes, Councillor Hamilton. I'm just a little bit unsure about committing to something which we haven't yet had a financial report on. Um, so would you consider Councillor Gangel putting in subject to financial estimates? I'm not sure that's a commitment no. then, is it? Because you know, it's subject to something else. Question? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, just a question to Councillor Gangel. Uh, I understand, I think, that your intention is to um, commit to a body of work on both the North and the South Jetty. Um, and yet we're also um, committing at point three uh, to considering a further report that provides options. So uh, no, there seems you. to be a tension between those two points and I'm just wondering whether well, you might consider another sorry. form of words which uh, says that we want options for the replacement of both jetties. Oh, sorry, no, it, it need not to. I mean, it can actually say to reinstate the north and south jetties to meet the conditions of, uh, uh, well, to stop it to, to, to reinstate the north and south jetties because there's actually point three is just bringing back the report about what use of the uh, material will use. So if you actually stop it at full, um, full stop it. So if you just... Um, uh, that, so point three would read that a further report to council be provided at the December 2009 Ordinary Council meeting <coughs> to update council on future considerations for the jetties and, and to seek council approval of expenditure to undertake physical works to reinstate the north and south jetties, full stop. Okay, so is that now three points that have been combined? Three and four have been combined. Amy, are you clear on what's being proposed? Um, so, so what, what, what my, sorry. Amy, are you clear on what's been proposed? Yes, so point three has now been amended to include the words um, and south jetties. Yeah, but full stop and then delete to meet the conditions of the DA, DBCA permit. And then we've got a... So, no, so, so what the intent was, four. so if I could read, just if I, I'll read out the motion as I, as I intended it. So point one. Uh, the actions take. Oh, sorry. This will be the wording of the CEO, so I might not be 100% accurate here. So, the uh, um, the council notes the actions taken to date by the CEO to address the safety hazards related to both jetties, including actions to remove the decking and associated timber components from both jetties, as authorised by both DBCA and DOT, with works commencing on the 19th of November 2019. The DBCA response regarding the permit for emergency works, which includes condition to reinstate the North Jetty so it can be reopened to the public. Point three then becomes that council commits to the reinstatement of the South Jetty in recognition of the history and uniqueness of the two jetties to the town of Bassendine. Then point four is that a further report to council be provided at the December 2019 Ordinary Council meeting to update council on the future considerations for the jetties and to seek council approval of expenditure to undertake physical works to reinstate the north and south jetties. Okay, so you're clear with that, Amy? Yes. Yes, question, Councillor. I'll just have a quick question um, from the administration. Um, would there be potential DBCA conditions on the South Jetty or is it simply going to be a repair job? Um, I think we'd have to consult with DBCA in that regard. Did you want to comment further? Uh, for you Madam Mayor, um, we'd have to consult with the DBCA as Peter suggested. However, I would suggest based on the permit they've given us for the North Jetty uh, there would be no major issue with them granting a permit to simply reinstate the existing jetty. Okay. But that would have to be confirmed with the DBCA. Yeah. So, hold on a sec, Councillor Quinto, I just want to clarify that after Council Gain was read out the motion, you're still comfortable with the seconding of that? Yes. Yeah. Councillor Wilson? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, just a question. So, uh, it says that 
uh, a further report will be supplied to us in December. There was some discussion in the briefing that talked about um, the potential to use uh, plastic uh, in the same way that the City of Bayswater has. I'm just clarifying um, for the avoidance of doubt that that will be one of the options that is presented to us. Did you want to comment on the materials because it's a slightly different scenario? Yep. Thanks. <laughs> the, um, yes, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Through the through the chair, the um, the materials that the um, city of Bayswater have used. Um, I think the the phrase that got presented to me was their marketing was very clever, and that the hundred percent recycling is mainly in the decking, not the entire structure. So the entire structure of the South Jetty needs to be interrogated um, to ascertain the stability of the of the footing. So that's, I suppose, the engineering recommendation of our next step, and then to inform council in December of what those implications are. Other questions? Okay, so then we've had council again to move um, with the additional point that's committing to reinstating both of the jetties, and Councillor Quinton has seconded. Is there anybody who is against this motion? Okay, so all those in favour? That is carried unanimously. So moving on to item 10.3, it's the local integrated transport plan. I believe there are a number of questions. Is that a question, Councillor? Yes, it is indeed. I've got a number of questions. But but if I could, I've been waiting a whole week. I'm very excited for, the, for, for this response. So, parking, P2. Supply a pilot uh, electric vehicle recharging infrastructure. I did ask at last week's briefing session. You did, yes. Yes, I've been waiting an entire week, so I'm very excited to get the number tonight. How often has that been used? Do we have that information available? I might not have been clear on the recording. I might have to listen to it again. The, um, yeah, through the chair, look, apologies, John, I don't have that information at hand. We did present that information um, a few months ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it is in the, on record. Uh, uh, from recollection, it's only been a few times over yeah. the past 12 months. Thank yeah. you. And then if, if I could, I do have a number of questions on, on this report, but just in relation to P2 then, um, I'm not sure what, why that's there. Is, is that saying we should we should supply more of them? Because if we've already got it, I don't understand why it's actually here as a recommendation. Because it doesn't say um, supply more. It says supply a pilot electric vehicle recharging infrastructure, which we've already got. So I don't know why that's actually there. I think when we started this project, we didn't actually have the recharging station, so it's just one. That's oh, okay, that's 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 lingered on. Okay, and hasn't been deleted. Okay. You got another question? Uh, yes, just in relation to um, advocate for sinking of the Midland line to facilitate at grade connectivity. So that's P T seven. Um, I just note that that's short. So I don't think that's a short term project. Does that mean is in short we're going to write a letter tomorrow and start the advocating process or is that short as in we want to sink it tomorrow? <laughs> well, no, we're going to sink it tomorrow, I think we'd be very yeah. happy, but I'm just <laughs> because it's it says advocacy short. that's been yeah. there, so it's more it's more <coughs> advocacy. So it was one of the advocacy priorities that yeah. Councillor so Hamilton and I raised with our local member recently. Okay, then leading on to that, uh, AT2, advocate support redesign of Ashfield and Success Hill pedestrian bridges to achieve DDA compliance. Now that's medium. I would have thought by far that would be more pressing than something that, that potentially is, is really a long way off in the sinking of the, uh, of the line, but yet we have advocate and support redesign of Ashfield and Success Hill pedestrian bridges as medium. So Councillor Gangel, are you proposing you'd like to make an amendment to change that for short No, I'm just road? wondering why it's it's medium. So so these were discussed at concept workshops with councillors previously and yep. that's influenced the ratings. So if if that's okay. something that yep. you're proposing should be changed. Most, most definitely, thank you. Um, Okay, so I think the, uh, the, the main roads proposal for Guildford Road will be debated, so I won't, uh, I won't speak of that. Just in relation to convert Walter Road East from four travel lanes 
to two within uh, medium division. Which now, are you at? I'm oh, sorry, I'm at RN three on page eighteen. Um, just in relation to Walter Road, my understanding, I think about four years ago, we actually put drainage all the way through, or might have been sewage, drainage or sewage, one of the two, all the way through Walter Road East, which actually not under the footpath, but actually at the road. Um, so I'm wondering if that has been taken into consideration, because obviously if you, if you pave that in, then you're not going to be able to access the drainage points there, the sewage points. Has that been considered? Thanks, John. Um, yeah, through the chair, I think that, w well, obviously we'll um, assess that through the, the process of um, um, doing the engineering options for Walter Road. Yeah, and also just one point that uh, um, Councillor McWilliams raised last week was obviously the uh, emergency services vehicles, they quite de quite often detour down onto Walter Road because it is the two line. I do understand that there's that uh, area where the roundabout is, but largely it's the two line, so cars can pull over to let um, emergency services vehicles through. Councillor Kent, I think um, on that one, as we discussed last week, there's no intention to narrow the actual bitumen surface of the road. So I think the proposal is to have median and bike lanes, so it wouldn't actually impact the, oh, okay. the ability for emergency So it's still be four lanes? No, it'd still be the current width, but with oh. median island and bike lanes. Oh, and okay. Okay, I okay, get what you say. Okay, yes, now I get you. Road. Okay. <laughs> yep. I get you now. We're, we're, we're not yet. So on the outskirts will be two bike lanes. Oh, I think Mr. Um, Gibson's got something to add. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, the broad intention behind that recommendation is to provide for one lane of traffic each way with bus embayments, uh, a bicycle lane and a centre median. Mm. So it would actually constrict traffic to one lane each way. Oh, okay, yep, thank you. Um, just um, on page 19, RN10, I've only got a couple of questions left, councillors, so thank you for your indulgence. Um, create a pedestrian-friendly town centre. And I notice that is short. Now, the town centre is mentioned there because the one that I... I can't remember what, what, what fuzzy word you... you, you Just the vibrant pedestrian-friendly Pedestrian-friendly zone. Pedestrian -friendly zone. There we go. So, so is that what we're looking to create in the, in the pedestrian-friendly town centre? Yes. He's talking about RN10. I believe we talked about this last week as well. Yeah, I just want to get clarification. Would you like to clarify? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, the comment in the proposal is more generic than that. Obviously, it could include elements of a pedestrian first zone, but the proposal itself is a broader application, um, not specifically the pedestrian first zone exclusively. Wonderful. My last question, you'll be very pleased to know. Uh, just in relation to Lord Street, which item? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure which item it is. I just know Lord Street's mentioned in there, I think, um, about the um, redesigning potentially Lord yeah, Street. I think with it's the um, RN9. Thank you. Um, just in relation to that, uh, I note I took a, a drive up uh, to Beach Barrow and I see the City of Swan have, um, have ribbons all along the trees there, which I'm assuming isn't we need to water them more. Um, it's that we need to remove them for potential widening. That's me thinking that with all the ribbons along the trees. Um, do we know what Swan's doing? Because again, uh, it's an issue where if they have multiple lanes and then we narrow it down coming into the town. So I'm just wondering, does the town know what Swan are doing? Yes, thanks um, through the chair. The, the Swan design is two lanes each way. Yep, thank you. And ours is one lane each way. Mm. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Uh, in relation to RN1 and RN2, um, we were talking about Guildford Road. Um, <coughs> balancing local needs against uh, <coughs> amenity and transit oriented development and such. Um, would it be possible for us to put words in there that say that the stated aim of are in one and are in two are to preserve the tree boulevard that exists on the north side of Gulf Road. Is everybody following the question? Yeah. yeah. Any concerns? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, there's no objection. The uh, the proposal already makes reference to uh, amenity in a very general sense, but there'd be no objection to being more specific. Councillor Hamilton. Um, 
I just wanted to advise Madam Mayor that I have actually composed um, a short uh, addition to so RN1 that, that just covers that point. Do other councils have that copy as well? Uh, some do. I only hand wrote. I changed it slightly. Do you want me to read it out? Um, yes. Can we just exhaust questions first? Yep. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just in relation to RN8, which um, deals with the, the intersection there at Walter Road East, Lord Street, and um, 7th Ave, which is uh, currently blocked off. Um, so it says design and consultant, and the responsibility being Town of Bassendine and Main Roads WA. I was just unclear what Main Roads responsibility was in relation to that. Uh, intersection and whether their um, approval is required from works to, to be done. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, the road is reserved as another regional road under the Metropolitan Reader Scheme, so typically it falls to the local government. However, um, some of the commentary goes into the possibility of signals, and that would certainly fall under the responsibility of main roads. Uh, I know there's been discussion, however, about uh, possibly changing the proposal and the priority to reflect a range of options, um, which would not necessarily limit uh, the situation to signals, but if signals were pursued, main roads would certainly become involved. Just to um, follow on from that point, I know there's been discussions in the not-so-distant past around the Success Road um, intersection. Um, with much more minor treatments being proposed, such as keep clear zones and so on on Lord Street, and main roads was required to be consulted then and weren't, um, weren't forthcoming with approval. So am I correct in thinking that even more basic treatments could potentially require main roads um, approval before we were able to implement them? Uh, for you, Madam Mayor, yes, uh, in addition to signals, main roads has to approve all line marking. Thank you. Hamilton. Um, since that's been brought up, the responsibility um, column, I did note some, like for instance, I'll give you one instance, AT2, it's um, got their PTA and Town of Bassendine. Now given that that's the redesign, the pedestrian bridge to achieve uh, DDA compliance, um, why is Town of Bassendine the responsible authority there? They wouldn't be. It, it, would it not be that it's just simply Department of Public Transport and we're only advocating for them to actually... Is that why we're mentioned in that column or not? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, that's correct. Uh, okay. in, in a number of these actions, it would be an external authority, yep. but the town has a role in providing detailed feedback to the responsible authority or advocating for a certain outcome to that authority. I thought that was the case, but I just wanted to double check. Okay, any Sorry, just a very minor thing. I know that the the the, the sentence that says the d the revised document will be provided under separate cover as an updated version of the LATP was not available. What exactly are we adopting tonight with this updated version? Because have I missed an email or something? Because I that's possible. But also, it's not in the attachments for this. Yeah, it's a separate attachment. Yeah. Separate. Mm -hmm. That's why I get mine delivered. So hang on. Yeah. Is anybody able to clarify? My understanding is it was just a couple of points that reflected the recent consultation. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, through you, Madam Mayor, that's correct. Uh, the tense in the report was ultimately made to be incorrect with the passage of time. Uh, we asked the consultant to change the tense to make it read correctly, and that was the change. Okay, thank you. So that came last week. Okay. Okay, councillors. Um, I'm happy to move this motion and reflect the amendments that have already been highlighted. So that includes um, AT2, which Council Gans has flagged as changing the priority to short. So that's the um, redesign of pedestrian bridges at the train stations to be DDA compliant. Also including RN1 and 2, that are the Guildford Road. Um, modifications to include um, retaining the existing tree boulevard as one of the dot points for those items and also um, RN8 which is the Walter Road East Lord Street 7th Avenue um, and access to Success Hill area um, 
to, you should have a copy in front of you hopefully for the proposal for this, so to change the proposal to be designed and consult to find, sorry, to further refine various options for modification of the Walter Road East Lord Street 7th Avenue intersection and the Success Road Lord Street intersection to address access and egress to the Success Hill area. So that just reflects what is listed further on in the report but not so evident in the summary. And also RN8 priority, short um, engineering feasibility and modelling required to ascertain impacts of various options with a view to deciding whether this proposal should be adopted. Amy, does that make sense to you? Um, the RN8s do because I have them in front of me with yep. the other ones, I don't, but that's okay, I can, I can sort that out. Okay, are councillors comfortable with what is being proposed then? Not whether, you're, not whether you are happy to support or not, but you're happy with that you understand what is being proposed, Councillor Hamilton? Um, I'm happy to support that, but I, I don't believe that Amy's got the um, latest wording for um, RN1, if you'd like me to read that out. Is this your one where it says that the town wishes to retain the avenue of mature trees along Gilbert Road and therefore advocates for um, PTA to retain land adjoining northern side of Guildford Road, which is proposed to be given to main roads to facilitate potential widening of Guildford Road. So it, it just continues on, but I've just added a sentence at the top. I just need to ask a question about that because there was a conversation recently where <coughs> I heard that there'd already been some agreements between main roads and PTA about that piece of land and the lease agreement. I'm not sure, I can't remember where that came from, but... Um, yeah, through the chair, the, there was a discussion around that, it was, um, but th that was at the meeting um, uh, in regards to the adjustments PTA proposing on the rail crossings. So I, I wouldn't take that information as, as fact, I, I'm, that was just a, a comment that was made. So. I'm not 100% sure that that was true. I'd, and I suppose the other, the other reason I have doubt is because the minutes of the, the meeting that I, I wasn't present at, but I've read was before my time, that Main Roads had stated in there that the PTA wasn't going to give up any land in their, in their reserves. So I'm not, just not confident of that I being a fact. I appreciate the clarification. Okay, hold on two seconds. So Amy, how are you going with keeping up? We're working on this. We're working on that. Councillor Hamilton has also provided do you have that copy? Not with her additional writing. Okay, so what she's added on, have you got the copy in front of you? Yes. What she's added on under item 10.3, she's got proposals page 17 of agenda. She yes. would like to add RN1 and PT7. Yes. The town wishes to retain the avenue of mature trees along Guildford Road and therefore advocate for PTA and then as it is written. Comfortable. Council's comfortable that it's clear what's being proposed. So Council Hamilton, are you um, happy to second that with that inclusion? Yep. I know there are going to be councillors against, is that correct? Okay, so we will put that to debate. Um, so just quickly, I think the matter that is contentious is largely the proposal around Success Hill access and egress, is that correct? Um, I am proposing this amendment because later on in the document there is reference to the fact that this plan is proposing for the town to look more specifically at what options there might be available to improve the access and the egress from the successful area. So the proposal to um, update the reference here is reflecting what is in the document already. I think this is a particularly um, controversial topic where there's been a lot of discussion over recent years and the community would welcome the opportunity to look at various options rather than a specified option at this stage being the only one that is considered. Um, there's discussion further on in tonight's agenda about our local um, emergency management committee and I know that one of the things that that committee is keen to address is the access to the Success Hill area. So um, in my opinion it's important that we make sure that when we have a look at that um, we're not dismissing this um, without having full information about <coughs> the potential problems that could exist in the Success Hill region related to potential bushfire and other emergencies, but also acknowledging that there are members of the community who live in that pocket that have strong feelings about um, how opening up the intersections could impact on um, their community there. 
So the proposal is merely trying to keep the options open and for council to at a later date have all the information available around um, what the potential solutions are um, before we commit to one in particular. Councillor Hamilton, would you like to speak? Um, this is primarily a, um, a document to advocate for um, the town's um, desires. Um, obviously, many of these projects require extensive investigation and works before there's any meaningful progress. But prior to all of that, we need to actually advocate to state government partners about the direction that the town wants to take. And so that requires formalisation of our thoughts about what we believe will be advantageous to our community. So, um, as our Mayor has indicated, uh, there are a couple of ones here that are somewhat contentious, but we'll go to further studies. Um, but there are others in this document that are very much strongly um, held beliefs by this town that, or by this council and many in our community that we should advocate for, for instance, the retention of trees along Guildford Road. The widening of Guildford Road is one that I personally um, think would be a terrible decision because it would cut off the two halves of the town even more. So there are some issues in here that need to be addressed, but there's also some very strong points that we need to talk to the state government about and to make sure that we are representing our community's interests. Thank you. Speaker against. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, as you rightly pointed out, uh, my area of concern is with recommendation RN8, which um, relates to the possible uh, reopening of the intersection of Walter O'Day, Lord Street and 7th Avenue. Uh, I um, support the status quo in relation to that particular intersection and because of the peculiarities of the debate, the only way that I can make that point is to oppose the adoption of the entire report. There are some very good things in this report. Um, I guess with the time allotted to me, it, it allows me the opportunity to reflect, I guess, on what I think some of the lost opportunities with this process are, that right from the start when the consultant came in, the focus was very much on things outside of our town. Uh, a bridge across the river, uh, all sorts of blue sky thinking ideas and, and I guess what I'd hoped um, is that we would be able to look more closely at the roads that our people in our town use and uh, the way that some of the local distributor roads <coughs> work or don't work or some of the inherent safety risks in some of the corners and um, uh, you know, Deacon Street intersection for example where cars often slide off the road and, and, and onto the verge and the and I think that level of detail was, was absent from this process and it's a shame because that body of work still needs to be done at some point but we'll, we will take that up at a, at a later time. Um, if the minute clerk would be so kind as to note my objection being based on my um, uh, disagreement about RNH of this motion to get up, which I'm assuming it will, uh, I'll leave it at that. RN8. RN8. A speaker for the motion? Against? Councillor Gadget? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, look, there, uh, again, a bit like Councillor Wilson, I do think there is uh, great potential within this document. Uh, I do uh, acknowledge what Councillor Hamilton has said in that uh, it would uh, come back to us for further uh, refinement. However, there are areas that uh, uh, I'm unsure about wanting to commit directly to without further uh, knowledge of how that ultimate infrastructure will impact uh, from a neighbouring sense. So uh, I mentioned Lord Street suddenly having four lines into Lord Street coming down into one line uh, each way uh, in Bassendine. Uh, or potentially, uh, as Councillor Wilson has indicated, if uh, the intersection uh, at Walter Road East potentially isn't opened up, I know this is advocating for it to be opened up, but uh, if that uh, isn't, how that then would impinge on future development prospects uh, in that location. Uh, also, I don't want to uh, impinge on future councils in relation to uh, Guildford Road. Certainly, uh, if they're uh, 
uh, there's been great talk of recent time potentially uh, in endeavouring to get a inter uh, uh, light intersection at uh, Guildford Road and Colston Road, which may in fact require um, the, uh, the removal of some of the ficus trees to give space uh, for an intersection to be put in there and of course a new footbridge uh, across to the Ashfield train station. Uh, likewise, uh, things change. Uh, over time and the Ashfield Precinct plan in fact had Guildford Road diverting uh, along Railway Parade so again I don't want to lock uh, future councils in to, uh, to a position when, uh, when certainly in the future it could change and also uh, I'm just uh, unsure of the impacts that it will ultimately have as we endeavour uh, to increase the density uh, in the town uh, whilst uh, in some of these instances we're potentially not looking at expanding our road network we're looking at uh, keeping it even the same or potentially narrowing it in some some way so uh, just at this point in time I'm uncomfortable to adapt, adopt uh, the recommendation thank you you're uncomfortable to adopt the recommendation okay. yes that's correct any other speakers um, just before I close can I just clarify my understanding saying in relation to Councillor get councillor Gangel's concerns about R3 which is the Walt Road East conversion um, my understanding is we have funding in this year's budget that is pre-approved by council to start the planning for that work is that correct that's correct thank you um, okay so just to, to address a couple of the things that have been raised by my fellow councillors um, for a start whether or not the process has been um, as ideal as some councillors would like. We have had extensive number of workshops and opportunities for councillors to have input. And the projects that are listed here have come about through um, the community feedback process and many discussions with councillors where we've all had the opportunity, excluding our new councillors, to have input into which projects we want to be included and removed. And there have been a large number that have been removed because they weren't in alignment with the town's values and the community's priorities. Um, in relation to the projects that have been specifically brought out, I just made mention to RN3, Walter Road East, that Council has already committed funds to doing the design work around the conversion. Um, and the concerns raised by Councillor Gangel have been um, addressed with the consultant and raised many times, so I do not have concerns about the lack of access or the reduction in the capacity of that road. Um, RN9, which is the Lord Street conversion, um, we're not locking into anything. The actual wording says undertake further investigation to support alternative design. So it is merely an expression of the town's priority to be pedestrian focused um, and make space for bike lanes, active transport, trees that are all in alignment with the town's highest priority values. RN10, which is the pedestrian friendly town centre and so on, we discussed this last week because it also refers to slowing of vehicular traffic. So this is where we're going to be able to prioritise self-explaining roads, adjusting intersections so that they're safer for pedestrians rather than prioritising traffic to be able to move quickly through our town. And I do not agree that we're locking ourselves into anything. This is clear, clearly just a plan. It gives us some direction for the future. Council will still have the opportunity whenever these projects come up to our corporate business plan or our budget to make a decision not to pursue them. But for now, we need some direction um, as part of our planning process and also for the advocacy for our priority projects. So I encourage councillors to adopt this plan um, so that we have a way forward. So we'll put that to the vote. So all those in favour of the officer recommendation with the amendments that were um, outlined previously. So we have Councillor Quinton, Barty, Hamilton, McWilliam and McLennan. And against is Councillor Wilson and Gangell. And Councillor Wilson had the request to have his objection noted. It is really difficult to remember two new councillors' names in that process. Please forgive me if I stumble for a moment. Okay, moving on to item 10.4, it's the Bassin Dream Our Future Preliminary Engagement Report. So councillors being asked to adopt the report which feeds back um, what our community has identified as their priorities for our town um, in the planning process that we're about to undertake. Councillor Gangel, a question? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Just a couple of questions on this one for me. Just wondering if, uh, I know there's uh, on page 23 of 80 under communication and engagement, three stakeholder forums attended by 34 representatives or 15 organisations, so they're, they're all specifically for community groups, sporting clubs, those sort of things, thank you. And then three design workshops, which had 45 participants. They were the ones in the community hall, Eden Hill and Ashfield. Thank you, just wanted to confirm that. Um, I, I, I note reading the report 
uh, a lot of the responses were largely going on on because um, I had it in brackets, how many people responded. So some was, were as low as 24. Some were, I mean, it's still relatively low in the whole scheme of things, 94. So 97, I think, might have been a high point, somewhere around there. So you, you, you're working on, under the, the 100 bracket in, in responses that we're driving our future planning for. Um, so my can, I just, can I just clarify, because I think yeah. what you're referring to is that survey, which was only yes. um, one no, the, part of the... the so survey. there's a series of surveys yeah. that were attached, and each of them had brackets yeah. in, in who responded in, a, in, each, in each one, and in each of them, there was only a, a thing in the low point 24, high point 94 in each of the surveys that were, that were taken out, mm -hmm. um, done, undertaken. Um, but my, my question is, just so now, just so I get an understanding, I have asked this previously, so, with this report now, with Bass and Dream, with adopting this, a time frame for when our planning scheme then gets changed and modified and the community can actually start seeing proposals on the ground for what we're looking to implement. Uh, for you, Madam Mayor. Um, I report we... if. Assuming council adopt this tonight, uh, in any event, a report we presented to council to the December round, sorry, the February 2020 round of meetings to basically summarise what has happened thus far in terms of our journey towards a new local planning strategy. Uh, it will consolidate the advice we received from David Caddy, chairman of the planning commission, next week. Uh, meetings that I'll be having with department staff, and it will set out a fairly clear roadmap of how we progress towards a new or amended scheme. So that will be presented to Council in February next year. Thank you. And just um, one follow-up question. Uh, is there at this stage, do you know of any uh, fast-tracking mechanisms? Because I know when I've asked it previously, we've been looking at the three-year range, which is quite some considerable time out, considering there's been uh, a period of time since we've done Town Planning Scheme 10. Uh, is there some fast tracking that be, can be done to actually narrow that down substantially from the three-year estimation? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, the regulations set out the process, um, and that will be reported to Council in February about what needs to happen for Council to adopt a new local planning strategy. Um, the regulations don't provide a, a different stream to fast track any particular process, however, um, I would suggest, given that we have very valuable insight into community sentiment based on the Bass and Dream work, this planning strategy we'll put together will be well informed, uh, more so than had we done it in the absence of this work. And assuming, of course, that we align our strategy with the aspirations and um, views of the community based on the Bass and Dream work, the consultation process should be relatively smooth. Uh, certainly smoother than it would have been if we just simply speculated on what the community may have wanted. Uh, that won't necessarily fast track the process, but it will certainly make the collation of the submissions and reporting back to Council a swifter process. So in terms of the question of whether there is a, an alternative fast track stream to get us to our end point quicker, the regulations don't provide that. Uh, but I suppose we and myself will be maintaining a strong lines of communication with the department to make sure we're moving this on as as fast as possible because it's made very clear to me so far that it's a high priority to the community and it's a high priority to the councillors and we now have the most important piece of the puzzle which is the Bass and Dream work. Once this is adopted by council we'll be able to go to the next step and that, the next time that comes to council will be in February where you have a clear roadmap of how you go from where we are now to a new or amended scheme. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Hamilton? Um, curiosity question. Um, What's this document provided to the Design Basso members, given how much time they devoted to um, meetings? Um, it's, it's a publicly available document now that sits on our website, and we're also looking at um, mechanisms to uh, condense, I guess, the content into an easily digestible format, but that can certainly be made available to de Design Basso. So, um, okay. Just hold on a moment. I sent an email this week, and I think Yvonne was going to include that next time the Basso Dream Basso. Design Basso group were contacted. Okay. And will the Design Basso group be um, meeting with? Our 
Luke. Yes. We were just talking about that today, weren't we? <laughs> so we've just done some work around tree preservation on development sites and talked about um, inviting the Design Bazo Group back together to uh, work through some of those issues given that we've got a good cross-section of planners, landscape architects, um, builders, etc. So I'm um, looking at bringing that group back together again to introduce them to our new Director of Community Planning and also present Bass and Dream and the work we've done around tree preservation. So will that be before February's presentation? Because this group did devote an enormous amount of time and energy um, to assist us in the past and I think it would be advantageous to actually have that group meet again before your presentation in February. So Peter's taking note of that, so thanks. Okay, okay if there's no further questions, do we have a mover for the officer recommendation? Is that a question or a moving? Moving. moving. Is there a seconder? Councillor Quinton, is there anybody against? All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Um, so 10.5, the Community Safety and Crime Prevention um, update. Councillor Hamilton, did you have a question about this or uh, an that's amendment? not a question. I had a very um, simple extra dot point to add on there, um, which I've circulated to the council. Amy, do you have a copy of this? I do. Thank you. Yeah. So basically, it adds a point three, uh, which requests staff, council, the council requests staff to seek out grant opportunities. You can delete during 2020. Um, because I did send a link through today of a potential grant which um, expires very soon, <coughs> um, that financially contributes to programs and or infrastructure supporting crime reduction. So I've just got a question, not, not on the um, not on the proposal, not on the proposal. just generally, just um, uh, just in the in the uh, in the officer recommendation, uh, the updates and the outcomes of the current community survey and further analysts. Uh, analyse of crime data uh, will inform preparation of the new community safety and crime prevention plan. Um, two questions. Firstly, when would that be presented to council? Uh, I'd hope we'd have something by uh, the end of this financial year. Yep. And secondly, would that also include uh, mechanisms that we have, like the flashing signage trailers and the camera trailers? If that's part of the response to the issues that are identified if that's seen as part of that yeah yeah because obviously it's assets that we have yes. and should be utilized yes. yes thank you okay so there's no further questions councillor hamilton has moved the officer recommendation with that additional point three relating to seeking out grant opportunities is there a seconder so councillor mcwilliam is there anybody against all those in favor carried unanimously um, so 10.7, this is the Bassanine Oval's facility, sorry, Bassanine Oval football facilities business case of development. Um, I imagine there might be some questions. We have a, a new um, second alternative recommendation that's been included following the questions, uh, the comments that were made at last week's briefing session. Councillor Wilson? Uh, I'd like to move the alternative officer recommendation. Okay, can I just see if there's any questions before? Yes. Uh, what, uh, what would, so I'm just trying to bring up the exact wording so I know exactly what I'm talking about. If we're going to defer, I just want to get some clarification about the spirit and intent of point two of the officer recommendation. Of the alternative officer recommendation? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is deferring our involvement uh, in the project group. What does that what what does that mean? What is specifically do you mean by that? Are we out all together until there's more feet on the ground or are we still going to be going to the meeting? Can you just explain to me what deferring our involvement means? So I guess uh, one of the conversations we've had is the amount of uh, resource that we've allocated to this project over the last couple of years and um, I guess it's one of those ones where there's no pot of gold at the end of end of the project. Um, we've been given funding to develop a business case. We don't know where that business case will end up and where it sits in the priorities of state federal government. Um, at the moment, there is no guaranteed funding. 
So we can continue down the path of exploring options. We've got two options on the table at the moment. Um, I suggest that perhaps we might want to put a third option on the table so council has a point of difference. But there is some work that needs to go into um, further exploring those options and getting them to a point of developing um, you know, a fully fledged business case um, and doing the appropriate due diligence around those options. So there is an amount of work that the town needs to dedicate with no guarantee that it might be picked up as a priority over the next couple of years. At the same time, we've now got our new Director of Community Planning on board who uh, will be working on our local planning strategy and part of that will be our town centre plan. So thinking about um, where Bassendine Oval fits within that town centre plan. So a couple of the priorities, a couple of the options on the table at the moment incorporate redevelopment of the football facility but also the addition of uh, commercial space to drive the income to maintain the footy, f the, the football um, club. So the impact that that additional commercial space would have on the town, there's not been any modelling around that at the moment. And obviously the question around can the town support that commercial space? when the density in the town hasn't actually increased. So there are some broader planning impacts, which Luke, I don't know if you want to sort of comment on this. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, to make any informed decisions about development in the town centre and surrounds, it would be prudent to have a local planning strategy. Uh, I know I guess talked about quite a bit, but and there's a lot of processes that hang off that strategy, but that is the point of the strategy to set that vision going forward about how the town is to be developed, where the population is to be accommodated, where the commercial land is to be located, and to what extent. Um, financial, sorry, commercial modelling is a very niche field. Uh, it relates to the amount of discretionary spending, discretionary spending in a given area. And I suppose the town where it is at at the moment, and the population has an immediate catchment, there is a it, probably reasonable to assume there is a cap on that discretionary spending. To make decisions now to possibly increase commercial floor space in an area where the current take up is modest at best would likely be disadvantageous to that, that existing commercial stock, and it may well be more it would be quite prudent if council chose to go that way to defer consideration of potentially adding additional floor space until once we have a better understanding of how the town centre is going to develop pursuant to the local planning strategy. So okay. it is not a decision the council has to make, but it is certainly a valid decision if council chooses to do that. Okay. So just, oh, yeah, just, just wanting to just close off the point. So I understand that we're kind of, it's like a cart before the horse kind of situation for us, but what ramifications would our non-involvement of this project be now for the other proponents of the group considering that we have been told time and time again that they're financially unsustainable going forward um, what's been their response if, if this project doesn't continue how are they going to continue to be involved in any discussions about it once our local planning scheme is up and running are we going to be picking up the project again at that point? What's been their response? So I guess my discussions with the CEO of Swan Districts have been around uh, expanding the options that are on the table. So the two options on the table relate to um, the new football facilities and additional commercial space. Um, I guess my discussions have been around a third option which might be a new community facility which could also house a football club but provide broader community amenity um, and I guess the business model that sits around that I guess could be either you know Swan Districts or the town of Bassendine so it's, it's quite a different model um, and it's more about thinking about the uh, I guess the prospect of a funding source so um, aligning it to a state or federal government priority in that regard. So if it was a broader intergenerational community facility that, you know, perhaps, you know, looked after, you know, children through to seniors, 
um, that might have more appeal. But at the moment, we're developing a business case without knowledge of the broader context um, to meet an immediate uh, situation that Swan Districts actually need an upgrade of their asset. Um, obviously, the town is keen, you know, and, and, and Swans are a big part of the community. So we do have, I, I guess, a priority in that regard, but there is no guaranteed funding and we've got this broader work. So it can be progressed in parallel. It's just at the moment, we've got some catch up work to do um, before this can sort of dovetail nicely. Okay, I've seen your question, but just following on from what um, Councillor Quinton has asked. Um, so point two says defer its involvement as in council, the town of Bassendean. Would the department and Swan Districts continue um, to meet and progress this in the absence of town of Bassendean's involvement? Um, I would imagine so, but um, then we wouldn't have any sort of influence in shaping what that might look like for our community. Exactly. Um, so that's... Um, I do take on board uh, what our Director of Community Planning has said, however my question relates to, I'm assuming that seeking out an alternative, then seeking out funding from perhaps federal and state, that this is not a short term thing, that this would be a long term objective. Um, given that you know a third option has not been adequately canvassed, um, do you see advantages in the town continuing in negotiations or continuing in the project control group in some format to represent our community's interests um, because I too have concerns that if we step away from this yeah. that the community will not have adequate representation in what happens there so if, if indeed they get funding so my, my question is stepping away from this do you see dangers in the community not getting adequate representation in what might eventually happen in that space? Yeah, I think it's just balancing up the two. Um, I think it's always obviously good to have a foot in the door, but I think it's also about setting a realistic expectation with the community as well um, in terms of what's being proposed. And there is no pot of gold at the end of this project. so. You can develop up the options, but then it's a matter of going into a sort of an advocacy phase and looking at how you uh, develop those options in such a way that they're attractive for state and federal funding. Um, I guess the bonus of Swan Districts is it is the only uh, football club, for example, in the East Metropolitan Region. So um, all waffle clubs are struggling. Um, so. There is an issue, I guess, to look at in terms of the, the model. So it's not just the asset, it, it's the whole business model. So, okay. another question? So continuing on from that, if um, the current plans, block plans that have been produced thus far create some nervousness <coughs> with the amount of commercial space that might be promote, proposed, um, would it not again be a disservice to our community if we don't attempt to influence a better direction? Because I'm, I'm wondering, like the block things have been produced thus far, were already supposed to go out to community consultation, but because members of that group didn't think it was optimal, that what had been produced thus far was not optimal, my question is, if we step away from this and the department and SWANS continue to negotiate, where does that leave us except with what has been produced thus far, which is less than desirable? With, with planning approval. Is there something you can respond to then, or is it just a rhetorical question? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'll just simply reiterate the comments of the CEO is that 
if we did step away, that would be one of the implications of doing so. Um, it, the town would still ultimately have control by virtue of the fact they would need subsequent approvals. It sits on a town asset. There would be other permits required, so there would, assuming the pot of gold materialised and a plan <coughs> is going to be put into action, there would still need to be other permits and approval obtained from the town. Okay. Are there any further questions? So just to bring everyone back, so we've got the two um, alternatives in the um, agenda. So Councillor Wilson has moved the alternative recommendation. You also have probably on your bottom note on the table um, an amendment that Councillor Hamilton has foreshadowed. So um, if Councillor Wilson, first of all, is there a second for Councillor Wilson's? Um, <coughs> I would be moving it with a further uh, dot point as well. Me to read it out. That would be wonderful, thank you. Uh, so, with, um, with, so it would be alternative officer recommendation uh, <coughs> with a point three that says uh, that council continues to advocate on behalf of the Bassendown community for the state and Commonwealth governments and the football industry to invest in the Swan Districts Football Club and Bassendown Oval. So explicitly okay. stating our support for both and uh, our advocacy role. Thank you. Amy, you got that? I didn't get it all down, but I'll check. Okay. Everybody clear on what's being proposed? So, uh, Councilor Wilson's moved the officer, alternative officer recommendation with a point three. We need a seconder for that. I'm happy to second that. Um, I'm imagining there's people against. Councilor Hampton, okay, would you like to open the debate, Councilor Wilson? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so, as the officer report says, uh, this project, um, for want of a better term, has been going on for two years. Uh, what the town's involvement was uh, always uh, was to facilitate a discussion between the state government and the football club. Uh, as Mr Gibson has pointed out, the, tain, the town retains ultimate control over anything that happens uh, through planning approval. If it is outside the envelope um, of the current freehold lot that exists on the north part of that town. So um, by us stepping back at this stage, we in no way diminish our control over what the final outcome could be. Um, what is very clear is that an outcome that the football club is looking for is contingent on two things happening. One, uh, a bucket of money in the vicinity of 14 to $30 million, somehow materialising from somewhere. Uh, and two, uh, the club having some way of raising enough revenue to maintain uh, that 10 to $30 million asset. Uh, both things are quite remote prospects at this point in time. Both things require um, advocacy uh, from the town to secure and the football club and our community uh, and interested communities to secure funding in order for anything to occur. Um, so uh, the discussions that have been had today um, are fruitful, but going nowhere without there being a very large bucket of money that is certainly beyond the means of our local government. It is also certainly beyond the means of <coughs> the football club. Uh, I do not think that anything is to be gained at this stage by continuing that discussion until such time as we can impress upon those people with larger buckets of money than our own the need to invest in this community asset. So uh, that is why I support us uh, drawing the line under the, the work that has been done to date uh, and to refocusing our efforts uh, to stand side by side with the club as they seek funds from outside parties. Uh. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything that Councillor Wilson has said. Um, I think when you have a look at the minutes of the most recent PCG meeting, it was clear that the group had, had got to a point where they recognised that the work that has been done to date hasn't achieved an outcome that is going to be meet the needs of the club, meet the needs of the town, or be successful in um, making the, the club financially viable. Um, so it's not going to be attractive to funding bodies. So I think we're not in a position at the moment where there's a viable option on the table. So I think given that we're right on the cusp of having a new, well, very soon, having a new planning strategy and a town centre plan, it would be advisable for council to just pause and ensure that this project aligns with the bigger picture plans for the town of Bassendine. As we heard Mr Gibson say, 
um, there is a very real possibility that anything that we do down at the Oval, um, if we don't get it right, is going to have a big impact on the rest of our town centre. Um, so it would be worthwhile making sure that we have everything lined up um, for the benefit of our town as a whole, rather than just thinking about the interests of the football club. Not to lessen the importance of the club, but it's also necessary to ensure that the plans that are developed eventually are going to be financially um, sustainable for them. And none of the current plans are in any way going to be sustainable for the club. So I think there's a bit more rethinking that is needed. Um, and that the time spent ensuring that we have all of our plans in place and that where um, anything future will be able to be implemented down at the football um, oval. Um, I have lost my train of thought, but um, um, I think we have a real opportunity to come up with something that is going to be in the best interests of the town, in the long term interests of the football club, and also be more attractive for funding bodies. So. Um, I would encourage councillors to support the alternative and as Councillor Wilson has flagged, to continue to advocate so that when we have a good plan in place there will be funds available to support it and deliver it to our community. Speakers against the motion? Councillor Hamilton? Okay. Um, <coughs> I appreciate the uh, perspectives put forward, however I'd highlight there's some contradictions in some of the statements that have been put forward. Clearly, from the minutes of the project control group, they have not come to a good outcome. Clearly, the parameters surrounding that project control group have been somewhat limited. And there's been a recognition recently that an expanded view needs to be taken. Now, that expanded view has not been explored. And I am fearful that without the town's involvement, the exploration of an expanded vision may not happen. So clearly, it's very unlikely, as has been stated here by a few people, that funding will be forthcoming. So the only way that I see funding as being forthcoming in this instance is via ex exploring alternative options, <coughs> taking swans on a journey where potentially they get an expanded view of what is, might be available there and that we explore potential funding from federal and state. Now, true, there's no guarantees, no pot of gold, but what I've said here is not short term. It will be a long term thing. Can swans survive for another three or four years while you know, everyone passes the buck with funding. I don't know. Um, would they hang in there if there is potential for funding? Probably. Um, I don't think we should dump this because it's become too hard. Yes, we're doing our planning, but that's going to be some time as <coughs> well. I do not understand why they both can't work in parallel. So I do not support the alternative to um, leave this. I think that there has been some basic work done. I think there has been a slight change in mindset. And I think what we need to do is represent our community's interests in this and to actually take that on a journey where we might get some best outcomes. Okay, speaker for the motion, against. Thank you, Your Worship. Oh, I have to say, if I'm notorious for one thing, no doubt it'll be the word uh, Land Corp uh, in, the, uh, in the town of Bassin Day. Legacy. Well, you wanna, if you want to talk about legacy, let's talk about legacy. Thank you for bringing that up, Councillor Quinton. Uh, the first thing uh, that the Council did when, uh, when uh, after the Land Corp proposal was put forward was to reject a $37 million stadium uh, in Ashfield. Uh, so that's a, a legacy uh, as well. Uh, I am very much uh, a believer in uh, being uh, an advocate uh, to get the best possible outcomes and the best investment and development occurring uh, in the town to our benefit. Uh, I personally believe uh, the Land Corp uh, development, the $185 million uh, town centre transformation project, 
that ultimately didn't go ahead. Uh, it had a lot of features that we talk about now. Uh, the access from the train station right down to the river would have been included. Uh, a living stream would have been developed uh, on the uh, on the big reserve, uh, as well as. Uh, including that increase in de density uh, in the town centre we so strive for. Uh, a lot of our planning, pl lot of our planning um, documentation would have actually been uh, funded and paid for. Now that is on the onus of the town of Bassendale. So uh, I think although whilst people uh, might criticise uh, the land court proposal, uh, the town has actually lost uh, a great deal. Uh, not to mention the $20 million uh, that was in the forward estimates. Uh, for the town of Bassendean uh, that has now been expended elsewhere uh, in the state on, on other projects. So I, I am a little bit torn with this one because I am a believer of, uh, of uh, being involved uh, and advocating strongly, uh, certainly something I've, uh, I've had a passion for since my time on council. However, uh, I also realise realize that potentially uh, it may be in the best interest to let uh, the partners outside of the town uh, discuss what is the requirement for the football club going going forward? Uh, the football club uh, is a major tourist attraction uh, in the town. I don't think we harness our marketing and tourism great enough. So I am uh, quite legitimately torn on this one, but uh, but ultimately I think uh, I, I do favour the officer recommendation. Uh, at least uh, staying in there, staying in the discussions. Uh, we've we've got involvement. I'm not necessarily sure I favour councils being I involved in the uh, in the control group, uh, as the alternative recommendation would also include no councillors being in any control group either. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gangel. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Councillor Quinton. Yeah, I, I um, echo Councillor Gangel's sentiments that I too am torn, um, and I I too. I am finding this a bit confusing and bizarre about why we would choose not to be involved in something that is that we that we own. Um, it feels to me like uh, if someone came into my house uh, and decided that they were going to redevelop my front lawn, I would like to be involved in that conversation. Um, so this is not sitting very well with me. I'm not really understanding why we wouldn't be involved in the conversation as long as it continues. Which, we're under, which was my understanding that they might continue this conversation whether we're involved or not, concurrently with um, the work that we're doing with our local planning scheme because we could be reporting that information to this project control group as they're developing, which would ensure that this project can be relevant and up to date as much <coughs> as possible, whereas like Council Gangel said, in three years' time, we then update them with everything when we could have kept them up to speed, in which time that miraculous $30 million might fall in their lap. <laughs> so uh, I would like us to continue to be involved. I'm not really... Um, like, I'm agreeing with you so much tonight. It's weird for me. Uh, I think the original motion has problems um, as well. Uh, I don't think that we need to go into a full-on hardcore uh, undertaking of an economic modelling to assess the impact of each uh, redevelopment option um, at this stage um, because we haven't done our local planning scheme. Um, I think we do need to do a review of the existing comparative business cases and planning studies because that's going to be done as part of the local planning scheme. So that point is redundant anyway. Um, but investigating the potential for re any redevelopment of Bassendean Noble to incorporate community facilities in addition to accommodating the um, Swan District Football Club is exactly what the CEO just said in terms of a community hub. This, as everybody knows, is something that I am very passionate about and have been talking about in terms of getting people into a one-stop shop that will enable them to come in, it can be a volunteer centre, it can be an integrated uh, intergenerational hub, it can be what the um, town of um, Vic Park are doing with their seniors. Uh, so we need to be involved in that conversation. We need to be driving this vision from the very beginning. We need to have a say at the table. Uh, so Councillor Wilson doesn't have to be involved if he doesn't want to, but Councillor Hamilton clearly wants to be involved. Thank you. Councillor, is anybody else would like to speak? Councillor Wilson, would you like to close? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the conversation has largely come to a, a natural conclusion. Um, 
It was to look at alternatives. Those alternatives have been looked at. There was no broad agreement on what the outcome might be. And there's real politic to this, which um, has been largely missing from this debate, which is unless there is an appetite for the Commonwealth and the state and the AFL to provide funding for a project such as this, we can engage ourselves in conversations for as long as we want. Nothing is going to happen. Uh, some projects have received funding from the Commonwealth. For example, Punt Road, which is a, a waffle, a, a second tier equivalent oval in, in Victoria, uh, received $20 million in Commonwealth funding, received $20 million in state funding, and received $5 million from the AFL. <coughs> Discussions were had. Lobbying was done uh, quite intently by uh, <coughs> people in the football club to try and get the interest uh, of representatives of uh, major political parties at the last federal election to try and get some glimmer of uh, a commitment given and none were forthcoming. Uh, maybe that has something to do with the fact that this is a safe Labor seat. Uh, and traditionally, uh, Liberal governments do not spend money on safe Labor seats, and traditionally, Labor governments do not spend money on safe Labor seats either, yet. because uh, they're more interested in funding marginal seats. Uh, the State Government has provided funding in the past for waffle-level clubs. In fact, Lathlane received a $10 million investment from Barnett. Um, mainly for the benefit of the West Coast Eagles, mind you, who are going to use that as, as a training ground. So, so the state is happy to give money to subsidise a training ground for the Eagles. The state is happy to spend $1.3 billion on, on an oval uh, so that the West Coast Eagles can deal with some of the backlog of, of the membership waiting list that it has. The Commonwealth is happy to give $20 million to Punt Road and nobody is interested in giving money to Swan Districts or the Bassendine community. Well, Not incorrect. one cent. That's so incorrect. we that's considered a table. That's incorrect. Uh, as long as it's to turn it into a, a high-rise apartment uh, wasteland, that's right. Councillor Gangel is correct. Um, so there is no meaningful discussion to be had. We can sit down and talk with these people all we want about uh, hypothetical uh, conference centres that will never be built, um, but that is a waste of everyone's time. The discussion is whether the Commonwealth Government and the State Government and AFL as an industry will provide for grassroots development, will provide for a training ground that is the home of Nick Natanui, that is the home of Michael Walters, that is the, the place where all of these uh, high um, profile footballers come from so that the sport can continue to develop. And, and until they do, uh, this discussion is going nowhere. Okay, thank you. So I'll put that to the vote. So those in favour of the motion, Councillor Wilson and myself, and against Councillor Quinton, you have to vote Chris, Barty, Hamilton, Gangel, and McWilliam, so that is lost. So we still need a resolution. Councillor Hamilton, My sorry. alternative. Mm -hmm. um, now, I take on board comment made previously by Councillor Quinton, and so. Remove B. Yeah, remove B. So can you just, what are you referring to, the officer recommendation or your? Um, My alternative. Your alternative with the document we're working on? Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, 2B, if we remove that. Mm -hmm. And C. And C. Hmm. <coughs> Review existing marital business case. I think so. I don't think C is relevant either. It's redundant because it's getting yes. done with them. So, so we just go, um, yeah, B and C come out of number two. So it will just be number two that we don't need yes, A. Yes, it will. So would you like me to read it out now? Yeah. Um, I don't know, are people clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So Amy, you've got that? Yes. So Councillor Hamilton, you're you moving it, your amended point motion point with the re removal of point B and C, correct? Two B and C? Okay. Sorry, we're having a bit of a, shouldn't be doing that. Um, Let's just see what you're trying to propose first, Councillor Hamilton. So what you've got listed as your amendment um, is as written except for the removal of point 2B and C. Yes. Plus okay. additional words. Sorry? Plus additional words. That's what we're working That's on. already yep. in there. Okay. okay. I've got a question. Okay. Okay, hold on. Councillor Council Quinton, what were you trying to clarify with the wording? Uh, I was just going to ask if um, she wanted to change the composition of the project control group. Um. Okay, 
Harder. We need to have a seconder for the motion before we can start making changes to it. So Councillor Quinton has seconded. So would Councillor Quinton like to put forward... I'm not going to be on it. <laughs> it's up to you, Kat. <laughs> OK. So which point are we discussing? Five. Five. Approves the change in composition of the project control group as outlined in the report. So that is with the removal of councillors, but um, Town of Essendon staff continue to engage in that forum. Is that correct? Would you like to have a councillor on board? I'm happy to stay on board. Yes. So we're going to have a discussion. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so can we change um, number five? Approves the change in composition of the project control group as outlined in the report, um, but to include one councillor member. Yes, no? Because I want motion. to. Would you accept Deputy Mayor to be on the control group? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at the town of Bassendean, the CEO, co chair, and Deputy Mayor. Fine. I'm okay. fine with that. All right, so we're changing point five. Um, approves the change of composition of the project control groups as with the addition of the deputy mayor, yep. as outlined in the report. Yep. Yep. Amy, have you got this? Yes, thanks. Everyone else clear? OK, so we've got a mover and a seconder. Anybody against? Councillor Ganjo. Did you have a question though earlier? Oh, I'll raise it in debate. Okay. Yeah. All right, Councillor Hamilton, would you like to open the debate? Um, Can I encourage you, if you've already gone over a particular point in the previous debate, to feel the need to yep. repeat it? So that's what I was just going to say that I have covered many of my points previously. I um, believe that there are advantages for. Um, our senior administration to be continued and involved in this to try and get a better outcome than what has happened thus far. Um, I have no problems with staying on the project control group. Um, I have witnessed what I consider to be um, limited explore, ex exploring of ideas on that group thus far. I would like to see an expanded view and I think unless we try, we get nowhere. So I'm a great believer in if we don't have our foot in the door, we're absolutely outside the room. If we have our foot in the door, then at least we might have some better outcomes. Thank you. Councillor Quinton? No, I've waived my right. Okay. Councillor Gendo? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, look, the, uh, the addition of whilst retaining green spaces. So uh, I'm not speaking out of school here. We've had uh, numerous reports put to us uh, over the years from Haim Charlie, publicly available. If you reorientate uh, the football field uh, and you put the football club uh, opposite the shopping centre and you have a bigger footprint, you're in fact not retaining green spaces. You're actually encroaching on green spaces. So. Uh, and then potentially the old clubhouse then becomes a car park. So you're actually losing green spaces. So I don't understand why we want to actually restrict the scope of what we're looking at. I know there's this big scary boogeyman out there that people ooga booga uh, are scared to, scared to confront. Uh, I'm not in favour of putting restrictions on uh, what can actually happen. And that, and that actually, those words, whilst retaining green spaces, puts massive restrictions on the potential that can actually occur. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is I would like to think <coughs> that we are now mature enough uh, to have uh, our administration uh, act on our behalf uh, and attend meetings without having to have councillor representation there overlooking them and overseeing them. Uh, I'd like to actually uh, just debunk another myth that occurred. Uh, so there's a myth out there that somehow the land court stuff was cloak and daggers. It happened in secrecy. Uh, well, council actually approved every step of the process. Every step of the process council approved. Uh, meeting after meeting after meeting, council was involved. Land Corp came to the meeting. Swanee Football Clubs came to the meeting. Meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, council was involved in every step of the way. I have full confidence, full faith, uh, in our administration to act diligently on the council's behalf uh, and I certainly don't understand why we'd want to restrict any potential uh, and those words whilst retaining green spaces does exactly that. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Ganja for entertaining as always. Um, anybody else who would like to speak? Councillor Wilson? 
Uh, <coughs> thank you. I, I raise to speak in favour of this motion. Um, if if the best idea doesn't get through, sometimes you have to support the second best idea, which is what I'm doing here. Uh, purely for the reason that if, if this discussion is going to continue, then there needs to be some democratic oversight. And uh, I can think of no better person than Deputy Mayor to uh, maintain an active involvement in this, uh, an issue that I believe reflects, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a person who I believe reflects community sentiment about the need to preserve the open space on this oval and will be diligent in doing so. So for that reason, I will support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Anyone who would like to speak against the motion? <coughs> For the motion? Uh, Councillor Hamilton, would you like to close? I wave. Okay, so we'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Councillor Wilson, Quinton, Hamilton, McWilliam and McLennan. And against? Councillor Barty and Gangel. That is carried. Okay, so item 10.8. Um, Councillors, you may have noticed that in the agenda, um, following the discussion last week about the need or not for this item of confidential, there's a note that is suggesting that even though the details be provided publicly, that the um, debate still be done behind closed doors. So I just wanted to put that to you. It's currently in the open section of the agenda, but if there is a council who would like it to be considered in the confidential, Councillor Wilson is moving for us to go behind closed doors and address this item later on in the agenda. Councillor McWilliam seconded. Um, all those in favour? So that is Council of Hold on, complete your hands up again. Wilson, Quinton, Barty, McWilliam and McLennan. And against is Councillor Hamilton and Gander. That is carried. So we'll deal with both of these um, item 10.8 and 10.9 um, under item 13, confidential business later on the agenda. So that means we'll move on to 10.10, which is policy um, regarding communication between elected members and the administration. Councillor Gander, was it you that asked for this to be out of on board? Yeah. Absolute majority, that's why it's on. Oh, okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Um. <coughs> okay, there's no questions. Sorry, Happy to Gander. move. Yeah, Councillor Gander's moving. A seconder. Councillor McWilliam, anybody against? All those in favour? That is carried unanimously. 10.13, the Town Assets Committee meeting. Councillor Wilson, you had something? Uh, thank you, Worship. Just quickly a question. So, um, some time has elapsed since the town asset um, meeting and uh, the point there about supports the procurement of tree species being 30% large, 50% medium, 20% small. I was just wondering if um, staff are in a position to give us an update on how that procurement is going. Um, through the chair, yeah, thanks um, councillor. The, the order has been placed and um, the delivery is, is planned for um, before next winter. Questions, we have a mover to accept the minutes. Councillor Quinton, a seconder. Councillor Wilson, all those in favour? That is carried yet. Councillors, can I ask you when you vote to hold your hands up just a few seconds longer because sometimes you put them down before I get to you. Thank you. So that's carried unanimously. So now we're moving on to item 11.1, .1, which is um, Councillor Gangel's notice of motion relating to weed infestation. Thank you, Your Worship. Are there any questions for the staff on yes. Councillor Gangel's item? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, just in the uh, officer comments, uh, it just says here, um, officers have organised for the town staff to brush cut the medium islands on Guildford Road. And goes on, approval may take four weeks. Officers have contacted the contractor for the steam um, treatment. And then it says, requested quotation to treat Guildford Road from Old Perth Road to the town's boundary at the traffic bridge. Uh, there's also a traffic island on uh, Guildford Road at the intersection where you, where you turn to go on to Collier Road. So it's just not from Old Perth Road to, to the bridge, it's actually, there's one. Extends a bit further. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, so I just got a couple more questions. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I appreciate my motion does stipulate uh, the the islands. However, on the southern side of Old Perth, on the southern side of um, of Guildford Road, you have where the footpath is. That is also chockers with weeds. 
So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine you would need traffic management for there, but I don't know. But certainly going along as you head up to Ashfield, it is, and it's a very it's an old style path as well. So you've got the old slabs, so it's not the the so there's just that that part as well. Um, and just wondering if uh, at this stage we have an approximate approximate estimate for the traffic control cost. Um, through the chair, um, thanks, Councillor. I don't have the traffic control costs as yet. Um, the, the process to um, put this type of traffic control in place on a road like Guildford Road is a month, and that process started last week. Um, we're still seeking approval from main roads to treat the road as well. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, as Ms Jacobson uh, observed in her contribution at um, public question time, the, the weeds on Guildford Road extend well beyond the boundaries of our town. Uh, they extend into Bayswater. I have to be paid for our town. They, they extend all down uh, Tonkin Highway. Uh, it makes me wonder whether um, the advice that we're receiving here to say that Main Roads has taken exception to our particular requirements <coughs> is in fact the reason for this uh, or whether it is just a, a dereliction of duty at large because it, it occurs to me that we are not different from any of the other roads that Main Roads is treating at the moment and I spend a lot of time riding there. So I'm wondering if uh, Councillor Ganger would accept a recommendation, uh, oh sorry, accept an amendment um, to his motion which would uh, include us writing, or the town writing to the state government to clarify what their position is so that we know that they are, whether or not they are taking a particular exception to our requirements around it or whether they've just cut the budget for this in general because it's not clear to me. Um, so I'll come to you in a moment, Councillor, I just remembered. So obviously this is an area that is under the management of Main Roads WA. So with Councillor Ganjo's motion, is what we're proposing that we are suddenly incurring the cost of this um, weed management that really should be in the realm of Main Roads. So essentially, if we pass this, we're taking on that responsibility for something that is ultimately theirs and the cost should be borne through them. Yep, thanks um, for clarity. Um, uh, the issue uh, is is also around the main roads contracts. So the, the main roads are looking into whether it's appropriate for for their contracts for someone else to be doing the work. So they're worried that that could lead to other local governments coming in um, to to take over this work from their contractor, and their contractor has these large contracts across the state. That's a concern that's been raised by them. So, so, um, so I'm, I'm a bit confused. So they're yeah, not doing, they're doing the work, the work. Moment, but they're concerned that we've we do it, it's taking work away from them? We've asked them to stop in our area. I'm we've not... Asked them to stop spraying. We, 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 so we've asked them to stop spraying yeah. glyphosate. Um, they responded initially. So I've, I got the history through Jeremy. Yeah. Um, they asked us... We asked them to stop spraying glyphosate. They wrote back to us and said, no, this is an approved product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, we then um, wrote back to them again and said, we're insisting that you stop. So they've stopped. So, um, but I'm quite comfortable that what the town is doing is challenging um, main roads and, and the, the care and maintenance of this area. Um, and I'm comfortable that we're working our way through it to come up with an outcome so the town can be... Oh, we'll get, we'll get to one point or the other. We'll either we'll get one answer or another from Main Roads. I'm still a little confused, but Councillor Hamilton? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> am I correct in assuming that when the town wrote to Main Roads, it was some years ago now? That's correct. Right, okay. So would it be advisable for us to write 
to them again in the current climate where there's obviously so much re-examination of weed treatment and the use of chemicals, would there be some advantage to the town in writing to them in this current climate to see whether there is a change of attitude or a stance? Um, yes, through the chair, that's what I was suggesting just a few moments ago, um, that we've requested that we take over the work, um, that, that we go down and whippersnip down the median which is being part of the, the, the request. But if it's their responsibility... But yes. So, okay. so... I'll just answer. <laughs> sorry. I'm just, I'm just curious because if it's their responsibility, obviously if the town takes over this work, there com it comes at a cost. It comes at traffic management. Is that correct? Is traffic management expensive? Yes, correct. Yeah, very much so. Okay. So, at this point in time... Would it not be better to write to main roads to ask them if they're still maintaining such a rigid stance towards using alternatives to glyphosate on that stretch? Can I, oh sorry, if you've got an answer, please feel free to do it. I don't mean to cut you off. Um, I'd infer that they have. So I see you just had a suggestion to maybe um, um, be considered by council. I'd be pleased to write to the Main Roads Commissioner, um, Richard Sellers, and um, advise him that there is a ban on glyphosate on the medium strip and we would like a natural alternative. Um, and obviously it's a responsibility of Main Roads to maintain the median strip footpath. And this seems to be a area of you know growing community concern the use of pesticides so it is your your area to to look after so asking them for a response because um this is affecting many councils so i don't know whether main roads have actually come to a position or they're just going to sit back and allow the neighborhoods to uh continue to flourish. Mm -hmm. So I've already raised this with Councillor Gangel and he's indicated that he's not happy to include this in an amendment to his motion but when I have a look at these median strips the areas that are of concern are the paved areas where there is mulch and plantings there are weeds. Um, I'm curious to have a conversation with Main Roads about whether or not that paving is required to be there because that could solve our problems. Um, if the paving was removed and we could have more mulch and uh, potentially greenery, even if there wasn't any greenery, just the mulch would help to maintain the weeds. So, mm -hmm. Councillor Gange is not willing to include that in his motion, but it's probably something we could have a conversation about as well. Did you have another question? Well, I mean, earlier, I think it was Councillor Wilson that asked Councillor Gange if he would accept, you know, a modification. I'm interested in whether Councillor Gange would indeed. Um, take the course of action that the CEO has recommended? Uh, look, I don't have an issue with whatever day-to-day -day course the administration wish to take. Uh, my view is uh, the leadership of this town had plenty of opportunity prior to my notice of motion being lodged on the agenda to take action, uh, to contact main roads. Uh, that hasn't grown out there in a week. Okay, so that is, and that compared to our other areas is quite extreme. Council Gange, it's the question almost, was yes, I thank you. I'm getting, I'm getting to the answer. Um, so, uh, just in relation, no, because my motion is my motion. Just in, in relation to what the mayor had said, I think there's a bigger issue with uh, medium islands across the town. Uh, I use Collier Road as an as an example this morning. That's disgusting as well. So I think there's it's a separate issue with the islands being ripped up and and mulch and stuff putting down rather than just focusing on one one area in the town. Okay, if there's no further questions, we've got Councillor Gangel's motion. Is it including the amendment proposed by Councillor Wilson? No, it's as, as, okay, as, as is. Yep. All right, so we're considering the motion as it is written. We've got Councillor Gangel moved. Is there a seconder for the motion? Okay, so that lapses, um, which means we then now move on to item 12, which is announcements of motion for the next meeting. Are there any? Okay, so item 13, which is confidential business. So do I have a mover to go behind closed doors? Councillor Wilson moved, seconded Councillor Hamilton. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Bill, for being here this evening. You get